Support local. I don't know if you heard, uh, but Lewis Cipher is closing down, actually. Uh, yes, yes, they'll be closed by the end of next month. So we won't be having our meetups here anymore, actually. We're going to be changing locations. Um, so we're, we're, very, we're very sad. We've been here for a long time. Um, but, but please support them while they're around. Um, it, it helps keep these, uh, these restaurants in business. Uh, washrooms downstairs, uh, cell phones, just please keep on silence. And if you want a recording, we should have a semi-decent quality recording after this. Just make sure you're on our mailing list. We send it out. So that way you can spend time and focus on the presentation. You don't have to worry about taking your own recording. Our legal disclaimer, I'll leave it up there. This is my favorite thing. Uh, this is, it's, a, it's big enough so that way you guys can read it easily. <laughs> Basically, if you have a, uh, if you don't like what you're hearing tonight, you you can leave. So that's the uh, that's basically what this legal disclaimer says. Okay, so who are we? Um, the simple answer is we're investor realtors. So what does that mean exactly? Um, I, I got asked this question not too long ago, which is why the slide has changed. Uh, but basically, we we do a bunch of things. So we're doing things like financial modeling. So. You know, when we go and look at a property, we're plugging them into some of our advanced performance. Uh, we're doing, you know, uh, ARV analysis on your renovation. Uh, we're using our Burr models to figure out what your return would be after after renovation. So, uh, advanced financial modeling. Second thing is we do planning and advisory. What this means is, you know, oftentimes real estate is part of an end goal, right? You're, you're into real estate investing or you've, you've bought these properties because you're trying to get to something else. So sometimes that means like it's an input to retirement planning. Sometimes it means an input into your next personal residence purchase. And we actually go kind of that step further to figure out your overall financial plan and where real estate fits in that. And, and if we need, we pull in like uh, an accredited financial planner to work, look at your RSPs and stuff like that. Uh, next thing is uh, we have deep construction and development knowledge. So uh, I don't see them in the room today, but we're doing a, a you know four plus one uh, builds with our uh, clients right now. So uh, multifamily units in the front, uh, laneway uh, or garden suite properties in the back. We have good knowledge of zones. You know what to avoid when you're trying to redevelop a pro uh, property, uh, things like that. You know legal basement ceiling heights. Uh, minimum side setbacks, all that kind of stuff. So we have that kind of knowledge. Uh, we data, uh, Database decision making is another big pillar for us. So um, while obviously gut sometimes plays into it, we try to minimize that in all our modeling, try to base our, all our decisions in data. Uh, we have a community, a bunch of our clients are out here tonight, which is nice to see them. Hey, Tyler. Um, he's not the only one. <laughs> I just didn't get to say hi to him earlier. Um, so yeah, a community, this is part of it. We also have this chat group, which we were talking about uh, with some other clients about uh, an issue that uh, one of our clients was running into, but we were there to support each other. So investors helping investors. Uh, and lastly, we come from experience. We do this ourselves. Uh, you know, this will be my 23rd year uh, in real estate investing. I'm super dating myself, but uh, yeah, we do this ourselves. So. How do you work with us if you're interested with us? There's basically two paths. Uh, if what you like, I know you like the slide, Matt, it's completely <laughs> brand new. We got the stick man out there. Um, so, brand new. so basically, this, these all come from questions I've been getting. <laughs> so uh, how do you work with us? There's two paths. So it's basically if you need, I'd say help figuring out a path, a plan, what might work best for you, or you're into something more complicated, let's say, you have ambitions to, I don't know, start a private equity fund, right? And you have people who have money, you don't know the steps to get there. That's where something like advisory can come in. Or you're, you know, planning for your parents' retirement and you have a, you know, you know what their portfolio looks like, but you want to understand what you could do with some of that money, how it could be redistributed. That's where advisory falls in. So that's one path to work with us. Uh, so you'd be at the top, you need some guidance. Uh, or you have kind of a plan already. So you already are maybe more familiar with real estate, real estate investing, and you're like, hey, you know, I'm just looking for a plot of land that I can put my multifamily building on because uh, I've got my builder lined up already and I know what I'm doing. 
great. Then you would come straight to the realty team. Either way, you end up with a realty team and uh, hopefully things go well and you're part of the community. This is our lovely team here. And uh, yeah, it's been pretty successful for us. We've uh, helped uh, clients invest uh, a ton of money. We've got a bunch of awards. Uh, I was invited to speak at the home show last week, uh, but I picked probably the worst time to speak, which is like just before lunch hour. <laughs> so no, <laughs> everybody's walking by on their way to get food, uh, but it was still a good honor. Uh, and just a reminder to our clients uh, about the WhatsApp uh, private chat group. Um, were you on a couple of podcasts recently too? Uh, yeah, so it was on the Rise podcast, Austin's podcast, talking about um, four plus one opportunities. I will be coming out on uh, Irwin's podcast, I think maybe next week, week after. That's the Truth About Real Estate Investing. Um, he's done really well. That's like the uh, top 1% podcast in the world now. So it's done, done good. Okay, update on the market. So where are things now? Uh, here we have our sales volume numbers. And I think this is particularly interesting. If you've been paying attention to what's been happening in the city, and what we've been talking about, it feels like, like it's on fire. Like the market is red hot. Everything's going up. Everything's selling. But the reality is we're still in a low sales volume market, right? It's, it, we haven't quite recovered sales volume wise. Obviously, interest rates play a big uh, player here. But also, new listings. There's not that much inventory, right? What's going out there right now is being absorbed by people. Um, so you have, a, uh, I'd say, a pretty good balance of uh, demand and supply, but it, we're still skewed on the demand side, which is why you're seeing headlines about multiple offers, about you know, 50 offers on a property in Mississauga, that kind of stuff. That's, that's what's driving some of this. But the reality is not much property is trading hands still. Uh, and I'd say interest rates is a big influencer there. Uh, average resale home uh, price. So I, I put this up and I drew this red line because... I wanted to call out that uh, you know we are well past the, the the low for the last two or three years. I think a lot there's this um, maybe a bit of a misconception that we're in this dip. And yes, we have kind of dipped from um, you know 2023 highs, but we're not uh, we're not actually that far off from them. And when we get into the, the deeper uh, graphs, which show by neighborhood, you'll see that's the case. Like we've recovered a lot of the pricing from the peak already. Next thing here, this is my favorite slide. So this is sales to new listing ratio. So for those who are not as familiar with this, this is basically absorption rate. So this is what new inventory is coming on the market. How quickly is it being absorbed by the market? I have that line on there because anything that is... 40% or lower basically means it's a, it's a buyer's market. So inventory is coming on, but less than 40% of it is being uh, picked, like bought by people. And 40% is just some arbitrary number that realty analysts have picked, right? But generally that's the consensus. And you can see here, historically, we've only had in the last three years and two months, one, two, like seven, seven periods seven months that we've had a buyer's market, right? And it's, I want to call it out because I think it's extraordinary. Like we're talking about an environment where interest rates have accelerated at an unprecedented pace, like pretty much, I don't know, is, is there a historical precedence to this? I think this is the fastest ever uh, rate in hikes. Modern, and yeah, in the modern era. Years. Yeah, uh, when we started understanding economics a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, we figured it out a little bit. <laughs> But this is like basically the fastest rise, and yet only seven months in Toronto has it been a buyer's market. So let, let that sink in a bit. That just, I think, goes to show the kind of demand that we actually have in the city. And that's driven by our massive population growth, right? So right now, we're technically in a balanced market. You start to get above 6 60%, you're in a seller's market. Um, I would say, though, that this isn't quite reality. Um, uh, the properties that are worth buying are going to multiples. We just had a multiple offer on a listing that we had last night. Um, so it is a, it's quickly transitioning, right? It's a, it's a, it's, if you want to get in, you, you should be getting in soon. 
Uh, I do believe that once we start to see rate changes happening in the next couple of months, all, a lot of the you know, people waiting in the wings, they're going to come out, right? And the people who are coming out now are those that are just trying to get ahead of it. Because we know once rates come down, we're going to see further price increases, right? Because people don't look at the end price of their property, they look at their monthly mortgage payment, right? And if that starts to drop, and we're already seeing some of that happening with the you know, fixed rate market, you know, you're, you're going to see even further price increases. Uh, and this is a graph of the uh, new listings to sales. And this is to show that the reason I really like um, the, the, the sales to new listing ratio as a metric is it's as close as we get to a leading indicator. So you can see here the, uh, the blue line, that's your sales to new listing ratio. And you can see every time it goes up, right? like look at that big spike in 2017, it goes up and then the average sale price, you know, a couple of weeks later goes up, right? So pretty reliably, we can say that if we're seeing the market absorbing things, and they're absorbing at a fast rate, makes this all makes intuitive sense, that prices are gonna go up, right? And they usually go up to a point where people stop absorbing it, and then it comes back down. And this is part of the, the pricing cycle. Um, and it's it almost always is a cycle, right? So we see here, there's a cycle from 2013-ish uh, to 2017, uh, then we had 2018 to 2021, and then we've been down, and now we're starting to see it turn again, right? We're starting to see the sales to new listing ratio climb. And when we see this, housing prices are going to climb. So and if you look, it hasn't quite happened yet, right? We have that spike right now in sales to new listing ratio, but prices haven't spiked yet. But I can almost guarantee you that we will see prices of homes in the next three months or so, like it always has, follow behind the sales to new listing ratio, right? So it's not a crystal ball exactly, but this is as close as we can get to it. So if you want to buy, like, do it now, uh, especially before the, the potential uh, announcements of rate decreases, right? Okay, uh, our own market data. So we, we start to drill down on the neighborhood by neighborhood stuff. Downtown single family. And as I mentioned, like if you look at um, sort of the peaks and valleys here, the, and so these are the investable neighborhoods that we invest in, right? So when you come and work with Volition, very rarely, it depends on your business model, but very rarely do we say, oh, you know, go buy a duplex in Scarborough. Like that will pretty much never happen. Uh, usually we're looking at multifamily in core neighborhoods in the city. So we track the, the performance of those core neighborhoods. And you can see like, uh, you know, the, the CO ones, the EO ones, there is quite a bit of pricing recovery already from the peak. Like they're, they're on their way up. It's not consistent totally across the board, but we're already seeing quite a bit of pricing recovery there. Drastically different from condos, right? Condos have not had pricing recovery. In fact, they continue to go down, right? And we know this because we're having a heck of a time selling condos right now. Like we have some clients, unfortunately, who have picked up condos, not through us, um, but you know they paid top dollar for them. Um, they're worth you know hundred, two hundred thousand dollars less than what they paid for. Their mortgages are very high trying to exit them and they, they can't right now, at least not without taking an enormous haircut. Um, anecdotally, I'm seeing many double listings. There's, there's not good data on this and I wish there was, but I'm seeing a lot of double listings. And what I mean by that is I'm seeing a condo listed both for sale as well as for rent. This is happening quite a bit, right? Because the, the only time you're allowed to double list on MLS is to see both. What does that mean? It means basically people are wanting to sell, but they're not yet willing to take the haircut on the price, maybe it'll take a couple hundred bucks or more, a thousand bucks a month loss renting it. They're hoping for the market to turn around. This is also my theory why we've seen a slowdown in the rental market because, well, one, we went through double digit increases. Can't keep doing that. But if you've been keeping a very close eye to the rental market, it has also slowed down to, you know, I'd say more normal rental rates. There's certainly not double digit increases anymore, but it's taking a little bit longer to rent a, a rental property right now. Why? Go on, go on to MLS and look at any condo. There's so many condos for rent right now, right? It's because people are stuck. They don't want to sell them. These are all people who are hoping to, to assign them, hoping to sell their pre-construction 
and now they're trying to trying to rent them out. Um, Do you want to talk about the opportunity for construction? Yeah, so I, I have their you know opportunity, and uh, I should have put quotes around that because it's like not it's not an investment opportunity. We we're not big advocates of pre-construction condos. And I don't know if this is common knowledge, but actually the reason you see so many agents push pre-construction condos is because the, the commission is like double, right? So you can imagine from an agent perspective, it's like you don't have to go take anybody from showings. So you, all you have to do is push paperwork and you make double the commission. So of course, there's so many people who are in the pre-construction space, right? But we don't, don't believe that it's fundamentally a, a, a good investment, not at this point in time. There's been times where it has made sense, but right now, no, and there are people trying to exit these deals now, right? They've bought for more than it's worth market. Uh, they're having trouble qualifying for mortgages. They thought they could assign out their contracts and make money. That's not happening. And it's very difficult to assign. So obviously prices have been coming down. Now where this may be an opportunity for people is people who are looking for primary residences. If you were planning to buy a condo to live in, now is the time. If you're planning to buy a condo to live in like a two bedroom and rent out a room to house hack, now, now is the time to do those kind of things, right? Because you, like literally we have clients who have bought uh, a lot of condos and they are, they're willing to sell them at bargain basement prices, um, but we, we can't attract buyers in this market, right? Not on the, not on the condo side. So if it is, uh, if you're thinking of, I don't know, for your kids who are going to be attending university and you don't want to pay somebody else rent, like all these situations where it's not a pure investment, that's when this makes sense. But it, from a pure investment perspective, they still don't make sense. Uh, carrying costs, cash flow, negativity, all still way too high. Okay, versus everywhere else. And so same, similar graph, we are starting to see pricing recovery happen outside of Toronto. So there's a little bit, but I would say the, the speed of this is much slower. So Toronto, downtown core almost always recovers first and it's followed by the neighborhoods outside of the downtown core. Uh, so this is like your Aurora's, Richmond Hills, that kind of thing. Um, but if you are out in these neighborhoods, you know you're not seeing these things sell within like five days, seven days. It's taking a little bit longer. The demand isn't, isn't as strong out there, but pricing is starting to recover. So that is Stouffville. No, no, no. Sorry, that is C14. C14 is um, Young Street. Yeah, uh, the west side of Young and Shepherd. C07 is the east side. So, like, we put them on here even though they're Toronto technically because they're they're the outskirts of Toronto. Um, and it's a good question. Like, how do you, why do you see that big spike there? Yeah, so if you look at the date on that, that is 2021. So when, it first came, when we first graphed this, I was like, what's going on, right? Because I was like, that's got to be a, an outlier in the data. Uh, this was due to a whole bunch of redevelopment that had happened. Because what we're tracking here is the home price index. So the home price index tracks a three-bedroom, like-for-like -like property over its course. Well, if you're going through a neighborhood which goes from three-bedroom bungalows to like five bedroom McMansions, which if you're familiar with North York, this is what has happened. Your asset class that you're comparing is now kind of changed and they're, they don't have the same sort of like for like property, right? There's like those bungalows are, are disappearing out there um, and they're being replaced with this. And there was a whole bunch that came on the market uh, in 2021. So that's why you see that big spike. And that's, that's pretty much, you know, because they're being replaced by developed properties. Good idea. <laughs> and I think that's it for me. On to... Uh, oh, you, oh, oh. Hugo, you're going to have two hours to talk. Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for an hour, and then that costs for an hour. <laughs> got all that, all that oh, content. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> I got all that content condensed down. Um, so anyway, if, if you guys aren't familiar with Hugo, Hugo is uh, a regular with us here. Uh, he's a, a mortgage broker, uh, but he's also a founding partner of Vine Group. Um, if you're not familiar with Vine Group, Vine Group is a mortgage brokerage. They fund billions and billions 
uh, I, can, I can say that because it is actually multiple billions of dollars of mortgages every year. Uh, offices all across Canada. How many employees do you guys have now? 28. 28? Like, oh, yeah, but bro brokers. Brokers is like 70, but the 70 do a lot of volume individually because we don't hire. He runs a massive business. <laughs> so, uh, 70 plus brokers uh, all across Canada. And, you know, uh, Vine's always been our go to uh, because they understand, you know, of course they can qualify you for your condo purchase, but where, you know, it's when we need that extra step, you're a self employed, or maybe you uh, have corporations and you're doing a, a loan from your personal corp or, you know, you're, you're earning money within a personal corp, something like that. When it gets more complicated, that's, that's when, um, you know, their skill set really comes through. So uh, without further ado, and while I get him, while he's mid-drinking his drink, I will uh, bring it over to you, Hugo. Okay. I'm going to sit down, because we're going to do it two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so efficient. <laughs> Let me uh, let me give this to you. Is that? Is that for recording? This is for recording, sir. All right. Well, th thanks for coming out, everyone. Is this the last time we, we do an event here? Are they closing? Yeah. Like, yeah, like close, within close. imminent. Uh, end of April. Oh damn. Okay. Well, great space. We have a new spot, but <laughs> it's, uh, I'd, I'd say it's a little bit nicer here. Plus you get to eat. Most of these things were sort of sitting around a boardroom drinking water and coffee, so it's a good opportunity to eat, especially at this time of the day. So thanks for, for coming out, guys. You know, there's a, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of stuff I can talk about when it comes to mortgages. So what I did when I was putting this together is I just focused on the questions I get a lot from investors and just clients in general, and I've consolidated it. But this is a pretty casual environment, so if you guys want, you know, I won't be offended if you just put your hand up or throw a fry at me or something to ask a question, happy to stop. Because again, this is this is for you guys, you know, and, and some of this stuff might not be relevant to you, uh, but I put it on there because we get questions on it and it might, it might be relevant for someone here. So feel free to stop me and, and just ask questions as we go. Like this doesn't have to be a formal thing. So just a couple items that we're gonna get into. So I do wanna get into the Bank of Canada announcement. It feels like, <laughs> You know, in the last two years, these bank account announcements are, are super important milestones that we're all kind of reading up and trying to decipher exactly what's going to happen with rates. So I'll give you a couple takeaways from that. Uh, I'm going to look at my crystal ball and give you some forecasts that are mainly coming from people that are significantly smarter than I am, a lot of economists and things like that. Give you a general ballpark as to what's happening so you can kind of plan. Um, it's tax season. How many of you guys filed your taxes, like personally? I'm gonna keep my head down. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not my it's not my favorite time of the year. Any accountants in here? No. All right, cool. Then you don't. No one's gonna double check what I'm saying here. Great, because it's probably wrong. Okay. Um, I want to talk about some investor friendly lenders. I mean, it's 2024. The rules of the game seem to change all the time. So I'm gonna highlight the lenders that are out there and the ones that are a little bit more friendlier for investors, just so you're aware of them. Um, I want to talk about reverse mortgages, or at least quickly touch on it. We surprisingly get a lot of questions about this, and it can be a very interesting option for investors, and I'll, and I'll explain why on that part. Um, I kind of want to refresh what we call the blueprint approach to investing. So as a mortgage broker, you know, we, we do have offices across the country, um, and um, we work with several, most of the big banks, almost all of them, and a bunch of other non-bank lenders, credit unions, and so on. And by strategically using these guys at specific milestones in your growth, whether it's your first property, your fifth or your 10th or whatever, you know, we can better build a uh, portfolio for you using the pretty challenging world of financing world. So we call that the blueprint. And we'll kind of just refresh that a little bit for anyone who hasn't seen that. And then we'll just kind of give you a, uh, a bit of an idea as to where, where the rates are today and some strategies if you're refinancing or renewing to consider. And again, the Q and A is at the end there, but just stop me at any moment if you like. So, so I'm going to keep turning because I don't know what slides. Actually, there's a window there. I can probably see that. All right. So a couple of weeks ago, the Bank of Canada had their uh, regular announcement. They normally have these things about 10 times throughout the year. I think the next one is, I put it up there, April 10th. And it, it'll probably be a pretty interesting one, but 
that graph here just represents that we've had rates sitting at 5% since July of last year. And that 5% represents the bank rates. The rate that really matters to you guys, for anyone who has a variable rate type mortgage or a line of credit, is Prime. Prime is still sitting at 7.2% with most of the banks, which sounds funny. I know it is kind of crazy. It's funny to tell someone who hasn't looked at, who just doesn't care about mortgages, but has a mortgage, and like three years later, they're like, I want to negotiate this 2.5% five-year fix. <laughs> it's like, well, just to manage your expectations, just double what you have, and it's probably still not enough. So it's kind of an interesting chat, but that's kind of where we've been sitting. How many of you guys, out of curiosity, have either a variable rate mortgage or a HELOC? Like half the room. That's kind of what the census shows, is about half, about 40 to 50% of Canadians uh, had a, or have a variable rate mortgage. So. That's kind of you know what, what the graph looks like. You know what we were able to gather from the Bank of Canada. If you haven't noticed already, they're very cryptic about what they talk about because analysts and economists will sort of completely decipher exactly the words and the tone that were used in their sort of summaries to determine are rates coming down anytime soon? What's really happening? So they're very careful with their words. But in the last maybe two sessions, three sessions, sorry, because we're in March now. Um, the Bank of Canada has been a little bit more aggressive with their wording and hints that we've likely stopped increasing rates and we're basically waiting for the right signals to start decreasing rates. So that messaging didn't exist for almost two years. And just recently, they're starting to be a little bit more, I guess, firm is the right word, about this is sort of the next move. Sorry? Oh, I thought I heard something. Um, I'm getting a little old and I didn't hear things. Um, which is great. It means that, you know, the next sort of move is likely a rate drop. So it's sort of imminent, but we've been waiting since July for that to happen. And I have a few more slides on when that may happen as well. So, um, so when you kind of look at some of the data and the, and, the, and the data points that are relevant to determine when rates should come down or why they should go up, one of the biggest ones is inflation. So the cost of goods is very expensive. I mean, I... I don't know what this costs, but I paid four bucks for regular coffee last week somewhere. You know, so things are expensive. Uh, life has gotten expensive. Rates have gotten expensive. So one of the metrics that we are watching is inflation. The good news is, is if you look at that graph, is inflation has gone down from almost, I think it was just under 8% in 2022. And just recently, the data shows that we're at 2.8%, which is great because the last two months were 2.9 and 3.4. So we've actually seen... A realistic downward trend and the Bank of Canada likes to operate within a band they call it a band that ranges from two to three percent so they say that if we can get inflation between two to three percent we're comfortable and that's where we want to be and that sort of signals to the market that the likelihood of a rate decrease is a lot is a lot stronger right now so that's kind of what we're seeing with inflation and I think I just put a couple of random things on here just for fun just to kind of show you what's going on so groceries are, are up now, all this data is 12 months back. So basically what we're showing here is what are the cost of groceries this year versus last year? So groceries are, are actually 2.4%, but the year before that was 3.4, so a little bit cheaper. Uh, rents, based on the math, were, are, are still quite high, 8.2%. So this is why you should get into real estate investing. Um, gas is up. Actually, this was one of the biggest items on the inflation data uh, and why the inflation didn't go down further. Gas is actually a little bit higher than it should be. A lot of that is just things that we can't control, wars, pipeline issues, and things like that. So that one is a little higher than it would be. Shelter costs, I believe that includes like mortgage payments and things like that. Also really high. If you have a mortgage, obviously you've been affected. <laughs> Clothing and footwear, I guess, is down. A little cheaper if you want to invest in some clothes, I guess. I don't know why that was on there. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's look at another data set that's important when determining why rates before you, go, before you go on, you want to talk about um, what Tim Mack was talking about with regards to shelter? I don't know Which, what was it specifically? Do you remember? Well, he was talking about how he's like, interest, interest rates are too blunt of an instrument to be able to also affect and have a dampening effect on real estate costs and rents. Yeah. And so he's like, he's like trying to pawn that off to other areas of the government. So, so one, one, one thing that the Bank of Canada has said is they will not use the real estate data and the interest rates as a reason to decrease rates. It's like, my job is to steer this economy. You know, if you're 
interest rate is too high or mortgage is too high, that's, you know, they don't say this directly or publicly, but it's not my problem. So I think behind the scenes, unlike other countries, uh, like the US, Canada is completely and heavily invested in real estate, all the way from real estate development to the service providers, uh, 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 repairs, insurance, all these things are connected to real estate and, and plays a huge function of, of the economic engine of Canada. Um, another reason why Canada has been at a big disadvantage compared to the U.S. is in the U.S., and I don't know if you guys know this, they're able to take really, really long mortgages, like 10 years, and they're just locked in. And you can renegotiate these things quite easily. Canada, for the most part, doesn't really operate that way. Generally, we're taking five-year variable or fixes, and there's penalties and renegotiating. So the U.S. government, when it comes to mortgage rates, wasn't as affected as the Canadian side, which is why this is such a big deal for us. And then, like you said, I don't know if that's maybe the, the takeaway is, yeah, like the Bank of Canada is not going to influence rates or decrease rates because we all have real estate and, and maybe multiple properties. Yeah, uh, but it, it is very important for the economy and does affect the, the growth. So that, that's actually this next slide is the GDP growth, which is kind of like the engine and how much we're growing, has a huge influence on rates. Uh, obviously, like anything, if the economy is growing too quickly, you want to increase rates to sort of slow it down. And when the economy is not growing quickly enough, Generally, you want to decrease rates. So all signs point to we're not growing quickly enough. Uh, I think we had a solid 0.2% of growth in uh, the end of last year, which is not much at all. Uh, generally, the growth uh, expectations for, for Canada are about three plus per, 2 to 3 plus percent on average. Uh, so we, we're really kind of on the low end of that. You can see, you know, 2021, uh, this is all done quarterly. You know, pretty good growth. And the last couple of cycles, fairly low. And a couple of them were actually in the negatives. I wanted to compare that to the US, which is this, this graph. Significantly higher. In fact, just in one quarter, they had 3.2% growth. And overall, their growth is just consistently higher. A lot of times, you know, we hear things like um, Canada won't decrease rates until the US does, which is generally true. But, you know, they don't really have a reason to decrease rates right now, at least as much as we do. So I think this is a solid argument that we might actually see Canada decrease rates first because of how slow the economy has been. And this is something that we probably need a lot more than the U.S. does because they're, they seem to be plugging away pretty nicely. So just, just some, a little observation in some of this data. Um, this was an interesting little slide, probably one of the more important ones in the whole thing. This is kind of an aggregate breakdown of where experts believe rates will be uh, towards the end of the year. So I know it looks a little confusing. I don't know if I can point with this thing, can I? Oh, cool. All right. There we go. All right. So this is April 10th. This is the next meeting. And I mean, this is supposed to be 5%. I don't know why it's got these random uh, decimals, but the expectations of a rate cut are about 20% uh, for the next meeting. So I don't think there's a very strong likelihood we'll see rates drop unless some new data comes out before then. But there, there's a 70%, almost 70% chance of a quarter percent drop by June and about 85% chance by July. So I would, I would be assuming a very strong likelihood of a rate drop uh, either in June or July. So if you're up for a mortgage renewal or a refinance, you probably want to ride it out a little bit if you can and see where the market's at at this time frame because that's, that's a pretty big uh, likelihood, right? And that's been pretty consistent for the last couple months. And there's almost a 99% chance by the end of the year that rates will be down by 1%. So that 4.2, um, sorry, about 75 points, or eight, I guess 80 points, it's not exact. Uh, so if you're looking at, and this is something we get into a little later, if you're looking at a variable rate, this is a pretty positive you know, indicator that we'll see rates a little bit lower. We've been budgeting around 1% rate drop by the end of the year. Some economists think rates will be down 1.5%. It really just depends. I mean, this is... Economists are wrong all the time. You know, we can only make um, uh, decisions based off of the data. You know, when, when you throw in COVID, when you throw in a war and all these other things, the data gets skewed and, and some of the forecasts don't make any sense. But with what we know today, these are pretty reasonable assumptions. So again, if you're looking at where rates sh should be at by the end of the year, I think a 1% drop is not crazy, super reasonable. How does this match up to US expectations? You know what? I actually don't. That's a good question. I didn't pull that up. I actually don't know. Uh, so I can't answer that. I can find out. That's a good question. I'm curious about it too. I think um, uh, the Fed was looking, they, they announced, I think on December December 9th or 10th, that they were expecting a 75% 75, 75, 75 point, point yeah. drop by the, by the end of 
by the end of 2024, right? So probably not as conservative, not as aggressive as Canada has been. That's a good question. I probably think it would be very similar, but their data has actually been pretty strong. So I don't, they don't have as much incentive to drop rates as we do right now. Um, and if you're going a year out, I don't have it on here because I thought it was just too far out. But if you're looking at 2025, the expectations are for another one to one and a half percent rate drop. So towards the end, I'll kind of get into some ideas and strategies to think about using what we know today. So just a couple, I think I've only got two things here. Uh, so it's tax season. So for anyone who's self-employed, actually, how many of you guys are self-employed according to the CRA? Okay, so a couple of people, cool. Um, the reason I'm asking is if you're in the process of getting a mortgage or refinancing or anything that requires you to show your bank a, a T1 general, which is your tax return, you want to have a conversation with someone before the end of this upcoming month in April, right? When your taxes are generally due. Because when we're looking at self-employed individuals, um, we're looking at a two-year average. So depending on how much you show this year, which is for 2023, I'm going to be using 2023 data and 2022 data. And that's going to set you up for the next 12 months. So it's really important to make sure that if you need any financing, you should have a conversation with your mortgage broker or your bank uh, or your accountant to, to figure out what's the right combination of income, salaries, dividends, and so on to make sure that you're going to be in a position to get the kind of financing that you want. The other thing that's worth mentioning is there's a very tiny window in the year, which is right now, where I can still use your 2022 and 2021 T1 general. So if I was looking at a file today, until probably the middle, maybe the end of April, I can get away with your 2022 and 2021. So if you had a great last two years, but you know your 2023 is not great, uh, it's a great opportunity to get the application in, get it approved, because the banks will generally use the last two years and close on that. As soon as April's done and we start getting into May, the banks will start asking for your 2023. And if it doesn't look good, we got to explore different options. So I think it's a really important note, if because it sounds like most of us haven't done it. So you know, keep that in mind. And then for rental income, if you own real estate, you should probably declare it because the CRA will find you at some point and come after you. Because <laughs> um, I've got all kinds of crazy horror stories where people out of the blue, it's like, you owe us this six-figure number because you've never declared it. So if you do own re rental properties, one or more, any really, you know, report it uh, because as you start to add rental properties to a portfolio, the banks are going to ask you for a T1 general almost, maybe not all of them, but most of them will definitely ask. And if you're not reporting income on your tax return, in some cases, they might not even consider the rental income, which starts to become a problem. Because if you've got a personal residence and maybe one or two rentals, and maybe those two rentals, you were getting a little creative with your rental income and you didn't add it, some of the banks might say, well, you didn't add it, so we might not want to use it, or we're going to use a smaller percentage. So if you have rental income, talk to your account. There's a lot of ways to to show rental income and show expenses in a way where you're not completely getting hit with uh, additional income taxes. So keep that in mind because it's crazy how, how often I see files that have multiple properties and, and these guys are not reporting anything. And I have to explain to the lender reasonably why this doesn't make sense. And usually the excuse is, well, he had his grandmother living there for a year and brother lived there and it's, nobody paid rent. So you, you, you want to make sure you're declaring some rent, otherwise it gets complicated. Um, so I just want to take a quick pause before I get to this other side. Anything I just said, you guys have any questions at all? So are you answering the question, is the worst behind us? Oh, oh that's, last slide. <laughs> we'll just stay tuned. Um, all right, so let's talk about some investor-friendly lenders. Uh, uh, so, so in case it isn't uh, glaringly obvious, I'm going to state it. If there is a 95% chance of rate increases happening by mid-year, um, decreases. Decreases. Decrease, sorry. <laughs> happening by mid-year, there's a 95% chance that you're going to see pricing increases Go up. on real estate happening mid year. So, uh, yes. <laughs> love, love. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I appreciate you guys kind of give me the intro and. Um, yeah, we do have a big brokerage. We have lots of agents. We do a lot of volume. And I'm only mentioning that because it gives us a pretty good sample size to what's happening. So yeah, we have lots of agents in Ontario, but we have them all across the country. And I can say that as a mortgage brokerage, and not everyone is buying homes. Some people are just refinancing. But overall, we have a massive uptick of people who are applying for mortgages, who are getting pre-qualified to buy real estate. So I can say with confidence that 
from our perspective, and sometimes we see that before you guys do. So very often they'll come to us first to figure out what they can qualify for. And I would say across the board, every market we're up. Uh, so there's definitely a lot more people planning. And, and a lot of the mindset is, I'd like to buy something now before rates go down and I'm going to pay a huge premium. So, you know, date the rate, marry the home, that whole concept. Um, all right, so investor-friendly lenders. So one of the, the benefits of being a mortgage broker, <laughs> quick question, have you guys ever worked with a mortgage broker? So I mean, I'm not going to try to plug myself. I'm here to just give you guys data. If you want to work with me, great, but I'd love to work with you. But I just do want to create, you know, some, some awareness because sometimes clients don't know this. First of all, we don't charge for what we do at all. Uh, I only get paid if I do a mortgage for you. And uh, so I think the, 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 the value proposition is pretty strong because it's, it's objective. I don't care if you go to TD, which I work with, or Scotia, or BMO, or whoever. I just want you to be happy so we get this thing done and we can hopefully do more business together and we can you know, maybe refer some people to me. That's kind of how I operate and how our whole team operates. So I think there's a good value proposition there. The other huge benefit, particularly for investors, and especially for investors, is that we have access to more options. I think officially we work with like 84 lenders across the country. And a lot of those lenders you've probably never heard of. Sometimes I barely heard of these lenders because we don't use them so much. But there's a lot of interesting lenders out there that you can get access to and that will do financing that you probably didn't even know existed. Whereas if you walk into your bank, and I'm not saying anything bad about banks, they're great. But if you walk into your bank, you have to remember they're, they're just going to sell you or offer you whatever they have and offer you the rates that they have. They're never going to say you should walk across the street because that red bank is way better right now than we are. They'll never say that to you. That doesn't make any sense. And if they do say that, they're way too generous, but that's not, that's not common. So I find that a mortgage broker is going to be a little bit more objective because you, know, you were mentioning compensation for realtors. Mortgage brokers get paid by the banks. Generally, if you're doing a lot of volume, they all kind of pay us the same. So we don't have any secret agenda to take you anywhere. Um, so the agenda is really just make sure you're happy. So I do want to, how do you say that? I want to show you kind of some of the lenders. So just to plug Hugo and buying a little bit. So Hugo is a so one of the reasons we like working with Vine is because we know that they have our clients' interests at heart. Uh, our clients' best interests at heart. I'll give you an example. So you know, I've taken many clients to Hugo, and one one example of an outcome is that uh, one of our clients had a really good relationship with I think he was in private wealth with TV or something like that, and literally Hugo uh, his team was like, listen, if uh, what, what are they offering you? Okay, you know what? You should just go with that. Go with that because you know you have a relationship with them. They're giving you a really good rate, really good deal, really good uh, financing options. You should take that. Exhaust all your avenues with them first. Then, when you're done, come back and I'll help you buy property three, four, five. That's an example, right? And that's that's who you want to work with. You want to work with someone who, first of all, can help you with your planning. Because everyone thinks of the, about their real estate as a portfolio, but you actually need to think about your mortgages as a portfolio as well. And so you want to work with someone who has your best interests at heart, like you know, like fine, where they're willing to literally just tell you, go somewhere else, because that's your best option for this next property, but after that, come back to us. Yeah. Right? Thanks, man. I appreciate that. No, you're right. I mean, I think that's just good business, regardless of the industry you're in. I mean, I want to work with someone who's going to say it say something to me like just like that, you know? Um, I think you have to sometimes realize that, look, I'm probably not gonna be the best option always. In an environment where maybe you qualified for a low mortgage rate and got a mortgage, and now you're up for renewal and your circumstances have changed, or maybe the, you know, the, 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 the other options become less attractive. So I might just say, look, just renew. I actually said this to someone today. I was like, just go with your bank. I don't think I can even do better. And more importantly, you're gonna have to requalify and go with this whole experience again. If you're not looking to buy anything else and you just want status quo, then I don't think I can create any value. But I'm happy to put in an email the lowest, dirtiest rate possible, and you can just do whatever you want with that email, right? Just to help you out. So always happy to do that. <laughs> um, this is a disclaimer. Okay, what do I have here? So play like a chess game. So the only reason for, I like that slide, um, and I think what I'm trying to get across here is. If you're building a portfolio and the idea is to have more than one property, you need to be strategic about the lenders you go to and the stages that you're using those lenders. Some lenders are better suited for the beginning. They're easier to qualify, better rates, and so on. 
and then other lenders are better suited a little bit later on. So that's kind of the intention with that whole slide. So the first one we'll get into is the big banks. So for the moment, when I say big banks, I'm talking about, you know, the Scotias, the BMOs, the TDs, and all those guys. Um, you know, those are all attractive options, and they're generally who we like to start with, if possible, depending on the lender. Some lenders are very friendly with how they use rental income. Other lenders are very friendly when there is no rental income. So, for example, a big question I get is, hey, you know, I've got this triplex. It's vacant, which is ideal for anyone buying a property, but there's no rental income. How do we qualify? Because my client makes good money, but not enough for the whole thing. We need that rental income. Some of the lenders will let us do what's called a market rent appraisal, which is someone goes out to the, um, to the property and gives us a breakdown of what you can rent, rent each of those units for, and we use that to qualify it. What's great about the Volition team is they actually put, sometimes we'll put a little bit of effort in, in doing the appraisal's job and just saying, hey, Hugo, here's a couple of comparables, send that to the appraiser. And I find that most appraisers will just use that because it's such a subjective like number. Like, how do you know this is three grand and not 3,500? Because I've got this nice toilet that I installed or this nice kitchen, right? So it's sometimes subjective. Sometimes, you know, we can get a little bit of support on, on the realtor side. And this is what they do really well is helping us with values. You know, we've seen a lot of values come down uh, in the last 12 months and they've been great at helping us build a business case so we can support the appraisal that we need to get. Cause sometimes those appraisals are just completely off. So, um, so yeah, so, so some lenders are a little bit friendlier for that sort of thing. Um, now the average lender out there is going to stop giving you money or make it difficult to get money once you get to four or five total properties, the rules keep changing, but that's kind of the general rule. Some banks will do 10 or more, but they're all sort of on exception as soon as you get past five. So what I want to focus on is a couple programs that we do quite a bit that you may have not heard of. So the first one is the NEAT for short. Uh, that's what we call it. It's a net, what is it? Net income after tax. So the way it works is if you're self-employed, this is just for incorporated individuals. So if you're not incorporated, it doesn't matter. If you're incorporated, let's say your business makes $300,000 a year gross. From those $300,000, you're probably going to write off some reasonable expenses and then whatever is left over is the income that you will either pay yourself or keep in the business. It's kind of the basic model, right? Uh, now, of those three hundred thousand, let's assume that you've only paid yourself fifty grand because that's what your account told you to do, and you left the rest of the money in the business, right? Makes sense. Uh, the problem is fifty grand is not going to give you much of a mortgage, at least with a normal bank. So what we can do with some of the big banks who offer these better rates and so on is we'll look at your financial statements and we can say, hey, look, there's all this income in the business. I can use that income in addition to your, your salary or whatever you pay yourself, and I can now qualify you. So going back to the tax season preparation, if you're incorporated, this is a strategy we do quite a bit. It's like, hey, pay yourself a smaller salary, keep some money in the business, and we can use that net income after tax to help you with qualifying. We do that all the time. It's a great program, and a lot of the banks offer it. It's just they don't talk about it. Um, net worth programs. So there are some lenders that will give you money. So let's, uh, as an example, let's say you need a... You're buying a property for a million dollars, you put down 20%, so you need a mortgage for 800 grand. In order to get a mortgage for 800 grand, you're going to need to show a certain amount of income. Now, if you can't show a certain amount of income, let's say your income only lets you borrow half a million, so you're short 300,000. Some banks will say, hey, if you have 300,000 somewhere else, we will give you the 800,000 because you can show us that a dollar for dollar is available outside. So that's kind of the very simplistic explanation, but if you do have some savings or holdings, that's something that we do. Sometimes we get a little creative with the client and say, you don't qualify right now, but let's refinance this guy, put that money here, sit on it for 30 days, and let's go back to the bank afterwards. So again, these are all the things you can do if someone is you know, planning into the future. Um, equity program, so that's really just equity lending. So some lenders will lend to you a certain percentage. Usually it's 50%, sometimes 65 of whatever it's worth with very little income. So you, know, you could be a pensioner or someone who's showing very little, 10, 15 grand a year, for example. You've got this property worth maybe one, two million with very little debt or, or no debt. Some banks will give you a huge line of credit or a big mortgage based on the fact that there's a lot of equity. And we can keep it on the A lending side, so rates are better and so on. And the last one is expanded ratio. So a little bit technical, but when you're qualifying for a mortgage, aside from having good credit and all these other basic things. The most important thing is making sure your income and expenses or your GDS and TDS, your ratios, make sense. So, you know, to break it down a little further, if you make 100 grand, the bank doesn't want to lend you more than 40 to 44% of your income on average. That's kind of the basic number, right? 
Some banks will let us go to 50, some banks will let us go to 60%. So under these extended, ex, uh, expanded ratios, we can get exceptions as long as I can prove to the lender why, you know, your, your, your income doesn't make sense. Maybe you have some savings or equity and all these other things. So there are ways to get files done if you understand all these different lenders and all these different programs. So on the A lending side, these are the kinds of things that we explore when we need to. Let me just stop before I get to the other one. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so when I say A lending, I mean like big bank lending. So let's assume that you could, you know, you've got a really high income and the bank will give you a mortgage for whatever, a million dollars. And situation number B is you can't show really high income, but you qualify under one of these scenarios. Most lenders will give you maybe not the exact same rate, but a very similar rate. Uh, there normally isn't like premiums added to the rate because you're qualifying. You might not be able to negotiate the lowest, lowest possible rate because you're qualifying under a special program, but you're definitely going to be very competitive with the market. So if we can, we try to fit you in on these programs if you don't qualify under a normal sort of program. So, yeah, yeah. So, so it's easier for me to tell you who I don't work with because there's just less of them. I think the only ones we don't work with officially is RBC. Um, CIBC. The CIBC left the broker channel about, uh, a few months ago. So I was just <laughs> thinking about it. So those are the two lenders. What about uh, HSBC? HSBC doesn't exist, so we don't, no one works with them. <laughs> we did work with HSBC. They were a great lender, and unfortunately, RBC bought them out and took them under their wings. Um, BMO just joined the broker community uh, very recently, and we're, we're one of the few teams that have access to them, so it just means more lenders. But national banks available, we don't use them very much. I, don't, I wouldn't say they're our favorite lender. Uh, but then you have all the others, like the, man, the manual life you mentioned, they're great partners of ours. Desjardins Credit Union is amazing. I don't know if you know this, but Desjardins is the number one bank lender in Quebec. And in Ontario, they're a very sort of niche player, but they have all these weird, crazy programs that, you know, blow our mind all the time. Like, I love dealing with Desjardins because we send them a file, and usually they come back and say, you're approved, here's a few things you need to do. Desjardins is almost like, here's an approval, you're good to go, let's send this to the lawyer. It's just like, whoa, did you guys even read this? But... We'll take it. So we love the internet. I don't know what's going on over there, but uh, they're great, great lenders. Um, Hugo. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. You may answer this later, but you, are there any lending programs for people who have multiple properties and have equity locked in, some across all of them, and they can lend across the portfolio? Yeah, I actually do have a slide just for that. Okay. All right. So the question was, are there any lenders that will lend to maybe a larger portfolio where there's a lot of equity? And perhaps you're not getting access to lending or the solutions are becoming difficult. Yeah, there's, there's an option, and I'll actually have a slide for that that I'll remember to, to link back to you. Okay, so we talked about aid lending, which consists of all the big banks, traditional type stuff, and some of the niche programs. Now, the next one that we um, get into quite a bit is B lenders or alternative lenders. And the B, you know, the marketing team behind these guys doesn't do it justice because they're not really B lenders. I mean, we just say they're really A minus lenders because as soon as... <laughs> So, so someone says like a B lender, they're like, and me like, no, don't even talk to me about that. That sounds like a crappy option. But they're actually really great options. And I have a business case that I'll show you in a second that will show you why it can be very strategic and a great solution and something you should be open-minded about. So when we can't qualify for a traditional lender, we move on to the next bucket of lenders, which is B lenders. There's all kinds of them. The biggest ones that come to mind are Home Trust. I believe they're the biggest one in the country. And then Equitable Bank is huge. They're, they've got ads everywhere. If you need a really high interest rate, it's probably going to be with Equitable Bank. That's how they fund these mortgages, <laughs> with those, those high rates. Uh, so B lenders essentially are going to be a little bit more what we call common sense. So a bank is going to be very rigid. You've got to check all these boxes, and if the boxes are checked, here's a mortgage. A B lender, you can almost get away sometimes with presenting a file that just makes sense, and they will be willing to consider it and you know look at a mortgage. So we call them more of a common sense lender. They're also going to give you access to higher qualifying criteria. So that ratio I said before is the banks won't give you more than roughly 40% of your income. 
Some of these guys will go to 60%. Some of them have no limit. They'll just go to whatever as long as it makes sense. So sometimes we can get access to better lending. Um, the rates are going to be higher, but not that much higher. So as an example, because um, they generally do one, two, and three year rates. When I put someone with a B lender, usually it's because I have a plan to get them out in a year or two as quickly as I can, right? So they're usually, in some cases, you can stay with them forever. That's not a problem. You just keep renewing. Uh, but the idea is to try and get a client out if we can, and we'll tell them up front. We're going to put you here because this is the best option for you, but when the rates come down or your circumstances change, 12 months, I'm going to do this. So, um, uh, but the rates are going to be a little higher. So as an example, a one-year fixed rate with a big bank is probably going to be in the high sixes, more or less. I don't know if you can get in the mid sixes, but at least somewhere in the high sixes right now. Uh, the B lenders are probably going to be in the exact same range. They might be half a percent higher in most cases. Where the B lenders are a little different is they do have a fee. So most B lenders charge 1% on whatever you're borrowing. So if you borrow a million bucks, you pay 10 grand. And I'll show you a little bit of an illustration of why that can make sense sometimes. So there we go. Um, now, if you're in a circumstance where your income is great, everything is great, but your credit is not great, maybe you had a bankruptcy, this is the kind of letter that we might use as sort of a stepping stone before we go to a big bank. And that normally will be reflected in the rate. So the rate will be a little higher. Again, on average, I would say these guys are anywhere from a quarter to maybe as high as 1% higher than the average bank. So again, it's not generally that much of a difference. Uh, the biggest reason we use these guys is for self-employed or BFS, business for self. And the reason is because they will look at, again, common sense. They'll look at what you probably actually take home and not what you report to the CRA. So if your business, if anyone is self-employed here, we all know that what we actually make and what we actually spend is not the same as what the CRA sees on paper. And they're going to do the exact same thing. They call it a stated income. So for example, if I make 300,000, but I probably only write off 100 grand of real expenses, so I really make 200 grand as an example, I can use that as long as I can prove it and it makes sense with the B lender for qualifying. Whereas an A lender might say, well, you only show 30 grand on paper, that's what we're using. So again, for a self-employed person, there's a lot of strategic reasons why you might want to use them. Um, all right, so I've got a little bit of a case study. So this is just a common one I get all the time. So IT person left their corporate job, they were making 150, so let's say on average, in IT, and they decided I'm gonna take all these clients that I've built up and I'm gonna start my own business. Now they're doubling, they're making 300 grand in this example, right? Um, actually, I think I, I did two applicants here just to make it easy. Uh, so each applicant has the option. They can either declare 110,000, so 220 of income, because that's what they need to declare, or they can keep a bunch of income in the business or maybe write off more stuff and only declare 50,000 total, which is possible too. Those are the two options they have. That's what we're comparing. So I'm gonna try and break this down through this little funky feature here. There we go. All right, so we're applying for a million dollars, right? And I've got an A lender column and a B lender column. So in order to get a million dollar loan, on average, you need about 220. And, and keep in mind, I'm always conservative. You probably don't really need 220, you probably need less, but I'm just being extremely conservative here. So don't, don't get scared. I say, wait a second, <laughs> that's not gonna work. Uh, so about 220 is what you would need to satisfy almost all lenders to get a million dollar mortgage assuming you don't own a bunch of real estate, car loans, and all this stuff. This is super basic. Um, now, your mortgage payment on that loan would be about 6000 just using average rates. Uh, the tax, your tax bill, so this person's income tax bill to report 110000 each, it's about twenty five grand each, so it's about 50000 bucks. So in order for them to report this two they they're definitely going to pay roughly fifty grand in Ontario. And then if we look at the cost of interest on this mortgage with an A lender for 12 months, it's 60 grand. There's no fee, so you don't have to pay a fee to an A lender. So the total cost between the taxes they reported and the interest is 110 grand. It's like a live scenario, this is real. Option B is um, a uh, B lender is only gonna need you to prove that you can show 190,000. Well, if this business made 300 grand and they're in IT, their overhead is probably a computer and some Red Bull. Like, very little, right? <laughs> so they can probably definitely show 190 uh, uh, to the CRA. But keep in mind that we, we can show 190 to the lender, but they only reported 50,000 on the tax return. That was the other slide, right? So they reported 50 grand, and in reporting 50 grand, their taxes are only 14,000, their income taxes. Their monthly payment on the mortgage is higher, it's 65.90, because the rate's a little higher. 
Their cost of borrowing, 68 grand is higher because the rate's higher. And they had to pay the lender 1%, which is 10 grand. But if you add up all these things, so the income tax, the rate, the interest rate, um, and the lender fee for one year, they've only paid 73 grand total over a year, which is like 37 grand difference. It's a massive difference. So if you're self-employed and you have the option to report less income, this might make sense for you. You're going to save 37 grand. That's real money. But all people will think about is, wait a second, you, you said there's a $10,000 fee, deal breaker. Right? So you have to look at the math. And most brokers won't tell you this. I'll tell you though, is we get paid like way less money on a B deal, but they're a necessary thing to do sometimes, right? So we don't charge any fees. At least I don't. I can say that. So whatever the fee, the lender charges is all that we would charge. So, you know, I guess, you know, contrary to what some clients might think is that 1% fee definitely doesn't go to us. And my incentive is to find the best solution for you. And ideally that solution is with a lender because our, all of our interests are aligned, right? So, you know, just as a heads up, if you're having a broker tell you you need to go with a B lender, they've probably tried everything else uh, because ideally we don't want to go there. So anyways, that's just a bit of a case study. And why, if you're self-employed, a B lender might not be a bad idea. And the, and the exit plan for this guy might be in a year or two from now, perhaps their business starts to show a lot more income and they're comfortable reporting a little more income. We can qualify them either for that net income program, maybe some net worth, or maybe just move into a, an A lender down the road, right? So that would be the idea behind something like this. So that would be a B lender scenario. Uh, the next one is credit unions. So there are some credit unions that, actually all credit unions are provincially regulated. And what that means is they don't need to do a stress test, or they don't have to. Some of them do, but they don't have to. So there are some credit unions that we work with that will, just, just to define the stress test in case you don't know, the stress test is whatever the rate is that you get, plus 2% is what the banks will use to determine how much you can borrow. So if the rate is six, the bank will figure out if you can afford this at 8%. That's the stress test, right? And I think it was actually a pretty good policy because when it was introduced, people were freaking out. But because of the stress test, we probably aren't in as bad of a position as we would have been if the bank was qualifying everyone at 4% back then, right? Or 3%. So, uh, that, that, but that rule continues to exist. Uh, but on the credit union side, some of these guys will qualify you based on whatever rate you get. So if your rate is 5% or 6 or whatever it is, that's the rate we use to qualify you. And that has a huge difference on your borrowing power. So when we're going through a bit of a review, we'll explore, like, does it make sense to go to a credit union? Because I could probably get you more money at a really competitive rate as well, because their rates are generally similar to a bank's rate. So I've got a little slide here. Oh, I guess the, uh, it didn't come through the way I wanted to, but hopefully you guys can see. So maybe this will help. Oh yeah, sort of. Um, so what I'm comparing here is mortgage income, uh, uh, qualifying income for both a credit union and a non-credit union. So if I wanted a $250,000 mortgage, I would need with a stress test roughly 85 grand. And again, I'm being conservative, it's probably not that high. But a credit union, I would need less. And if I go all the way down to the bottom here, a million dollar loan, about 265, and I'm stress testing it with a credit union about 205. So there's definitely a significant difference in some cases, depending on the rate you get with the credit. So we will use these guys to help with uh, purchasing real estate. Now, I should mention that this normally doesn't apply to straight rentals. This is usually an owner occupied or owner occupied with a rental unit. They're not as generous when it's a rental, uh, but it's again, something that we have been using more recently because of qualifying. So I'm just gonna take a pause there. So we talked about some of the different lenders and the landscape there. Any questions about any of the lenders or anything while we, it's fresh, yeah? Have you had any uh, challenges with uh, traditional lenders turning down clients yeah, so I think the question I heard was, have we had any challenges with lenders on a file where that client previously had a B lender or has a B lender or currently has a B lender? I mean, I would, I would say no. Um, I mean, part of our assessment and our process is to ask you why you're with a B lender, and we would just provide that explanation. Generally, there's a, re there's a reasonable explanation. Either uh, income didn't qualify, something with credit. So we would normally want to find out why you're with that lender if you would have otherwise qualified, and I would just put that in my notes. But the lenders generally are not going to decline you 
because you're with a view lender. It's completely, it's not, it's not a deal breaker. Um, yeah, so I would say no. They don't discriminate on No, they wouldn't. No, they're just checking boxes for the most part. Your credit income is, you know, your credit score is above 680 at least, is this kind of where they want. They want your ratios to be under 40, 44 range. You know, income makes sense, down payment makes sense, the property is in a good area. They're gonna give you a mortgage based off of that. Now, if, if, if um, there's issues with your credit and maybe you're in a business that is showing decreasing income, they might have more questions around why you are with a B lender and things like that. But generally, I don't think I've had a file decline because you were with a B lender. So it's not a, it doesn't hurt you. Where it gets a little suspicious, maybe that's the wrong word, curious, <laughs> I don't know, they're all bad words, is when you're coming from a private lender, they're gonna ask way more questions. Because again, there's nothing wrong with private lending. I mean, it's very strategic and makes sense. But they might say, you make a lot of money. Why do you have this mortgage with a private lender? Generally, it's like AML or anti-money laundering questions. Like, where did you get the money to close on this? And we're going to need to investigate all that. And those sort of questions are more typical for a private lender exit strategy, where I'm moving you from private to an A. I would want to know, too. I'm like, like why didn't you? Yeah, why didn't you? And it's the first question. It's like, why? Sometimes you, sometimes, you know, because we're talking about new builds, and just a quick side comment. We're seeing any new builds that are coming to close now, there's a high percentage of them that are below market, below the purchase price in terms of the appraisal. So it's definitely an issue. Uh, not necessarily in Toronto, in GTA, I would say. GTA in general. Uh, yeah, we're seeing a de decent amount to the point where, I won't say the name, but a pretty prominent builder across the country reached out to us and said, we are anticipating a huge, I forget what the number was, maybe 25% of our whole uh, new, new construction uh, portfolio that's coming live this year uh, will be under the appraisal value. So we need you guys to make sure there's solutions in place. So it's definitely a problem for some of these builders. And we're definitely seeing, I mean, I had a handful just last week, they were both between 50 and 100,000 less than the appraisal. And I think we've done three appraisals because the client's insisting that, you know, his kitchen's way better than the other building across the street. And it's just like, you know, this is just the appraisals that you're getting. So it's something that we're seeing as a trend for sure. What do you think is the threshold for them to follow up that one? What, like, not, not so what we've been told from their lawyers is as long as it's an owner-occupied property, we will work with the client to reconcile whatever shortfall. And the way they're reconciling it, I think, I've seen some, is they're doing what's called a vendor take back. I don't know if you've heard of VTP. So the way it works is like, easy example, I bought this for a million dollars, that's what my contract says, but the appraisal is 900. The bank will only lend to you on the appraisal because it's lower and that's what they're comfortable with. So you're gonna be short, whatever the math is, 100 plus thousand probably. So what the builder will do, in some cases, they'll say, all right, well, Ming, you're a first time buyer, this is your owner occupied property, you go get the mortgage, we will give you a second mortgage on the difference that you will owe us. And then once you're in a position to maybe refinance a year, two, three out, we can figure this out. So that's one strategy we see quite a bit. Uh, yeah, because I don't think they want to go back to the market and resell it because they might be reselling it at a loss. And they also probably don't want to be in the news saying, hey, we took your deposit and relisted it. So some of these guys are pretty, pretty big. So that's what we're saying. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're talking about privates. Sometimes people went private because some Times private is the only way to get the higher loans, right? These higher loans of values. What a private might do is, okay, I mean, your, your appraisal is only 900, you're short 100, but you have this other piece of real estate. We're just going to tag that and we'll give you the money you need. So that's sometimes why you might have used, why we're seeing more privates. Open up the uh, VTD can of works. Yeah. Um, if a seller is you know, in recent months, it was harder to sell a property and someone was going to offer a VTD. Are, are there lenders who allow the buyer to buy at 8% loan's value and then have a VTD for an extra 10% or an extra 15%? Yeah, so I'll just repeat it again. So the question I was asking is, if I'm selling a property and in order for me to sell it or maybe to incentivize a buyer, I might want to add a VTD, which basically allows the buyer to get more money than they normally would for the bank. And the question is, will the banks allow that? I would say on, for the on most, acquisition. on the per, so the person buying, can the person buying 
get a mortgage and a VTB. So as a ex same million dollar example, is typically the bank will give you, let's say, 800000 on a million dollars, up to 800000 unless you do 5% down. But let's just use this simple scenario. They'll give you eight hundred grand. But let's say you don't want to put two hundred grand. let us say the seller's like, hey, man, I will give you two hundred grand. So it's like 100% finance. You're basically financing it, 800 bank, 200 vendor take back. Um, I would say that the big banks generally will not do that. I don't think I've gotten one exception. Uh, but the B lenders will consider it. And that could be really attractive because if I get 100% financing and close on this, the idea would be that you know maybe a year from now I can refinance, pay up the VTB, and I'm maybe with an A lender. So we've seen it with B lenders for sure. Could you do it with an A lender, not on acquisition, but on day one of, or day two of, of, of ownership? But you, you put the disclaimer up right at the beginning. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question was, can you do it after? You can definitely do that. I wouldn't want to know about it. So I don't have to know about it and be involved. But basically, yeah, you can close on the mortgage and then whatever you do afterwards, that's on you. I mean, obviously with the risk that if the bank finds out, they'll call your mortgage, but I guess you could do that, yeah. Sometimes they have a collateral charge on too, right? So oftentimes, like mortgages that I have in Scotia have this like big ass collateral charge against as well to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. So. We just wouldn't register that high. Yeah. Yeah. So what he's referring to is like, if you get a million dollar mortgage, the bank will register whatever. Usually they register what you've got, but sometimes they'll register more so that you can re-borrow in the future and also prevents other lenders from like putting a mortgage on there. But yeah, it's possible. I think with the way things are going, it's probably going to be less likely a, a future because I think as we get into more of a buyer's market, I don't think you need to offer these incentives. So, so it's Seller's market, sorry. Yeah. Uh, this one? Okay. Is there a situation or other programs in this program that you have to be in that are for investors who have long term rental property under lending? Long term, is that sustainable also? Are there programs? I don't know. I don't know if I got the question. So I think I heard. Just say it again. Yeah. Asking alternative A minus lending growth. Are there long term options? There we give it away. <laughs> Are there long term lending options for the A minus B alternative lending? Okay. For long term okay. rental property. I got it. So I think the question was if you're already with one of these guys. Are there long-term solutions to sort of stay with them? Like, that's your plan. Like, you can't go anywhere. I mean, here's the thing, though. Like, a B-Lender is just going to renew you like any other bank. They're going to say, hey, uh, your renewal's coming up. Here's the rates. Take one. Check a box, and you're done. They're not going to requalify you for the most part unless you have, you know, they're going to pull your credits unless your credit's messed up. They won't requalify you. And very often, they won't charge you much of a fee. They might charge you $300 fee, but it's just kind of a basic renewal. So the long-term strategy could be just keep renewing forever, except your rate will be a little higher forever. Um, or I have a slide, and I think it goes back to your question, is we can do more of like a permanent solution on a larger portfolio or we'll move you to a completely different thing. And maybe that'll help clarify that. But a B-Lender, we like to use it as an exit strategy. So I put you there because I need to, but there's nothing wrong with just renewing. I mean, I have clients with B-Lending mortgages that are renewing at like 3.5, 3.9, and we're still getting a raise at six, starting at 6.5 for one year. So it's not necessarily a bad option. Um, if, if like, there's no scenario where you're going to be able to qualify in the next few years. So, uh, yeah. But we can get into something more permanent a, a little later. Uh, I was just looking at the time. I was thinking maybe we could take uh, our network break now for a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. but we have another hour and a half, so. <laughs> yeah, so, whatever you want. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we'll take 15 minutes. Uh, I always say your network is your network. Lots of investors in this room, lots of people who are super qualified. So take 15 minutes, get to know your neighbor, get to find out what they're up to, and then we'll come back here at uh, 8.15. Cool. Right. Right. So I've got a couple slides on reverse mortgages because we see way more reverse mortgages happening. There's a couple of interesting applications for investors and we get a lot of questions about them. So I actually did a segment with me at the home show 
We literally had like three people there, maybe four. <laughs> and I think they were sleeping. Stayed Half of them like, were sleeping, the other two were just yeah. eating because they wanted to see. It's uh, like a 250-person <laughs> stage. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was fun. But by the end of it, though, we had at least 10 people. Yeah, yeah. We were able to get a couple people in there. Again, I also think they were half asleep, too. Uh, so anyways, I, I did want to do a couple of slides because there's some interesting ways to get access to money either because you qualify or you have parents or family members that would qualify for it. So what is a reverse mortgage? Essentially, you can access money from an owner-occupied property or a cottage or secondary property um, without having to make any monthly payments. So obviously, if this was available to everybody, you know, it would be a, kind of the, uh, a, a gold mine for investors if you don't have to make any monthly payments because of cash flow. That's why it's become very attractive. There is a minimum age for reverse mortgage. You have to be at least 55 years or older to be able to qualify for it. And you can access up to 55% of the value of the home, the older you are, the more money you'll get because the idea is if I'm not going to pay you until I die or sell the property, the bank wants to make sure there's sufficient enough equity to protect themselves, right? Um, so if you do a reverse mortgage or you have a family member that does a reverse mortgage, any money that you take out of the property is tax-free and doesn't affect any pension or, or, or income that is uh, stress tested against the government uh, uh, pension plans. Uh, a reverse mortgage means that you still own the property, it's your property, you can do anything you want with it in terms of selling it and so on. So those are the kind of the basics. So these are some ways we see it. So we have had clients unlock equity to invest, meaning, I'll give you an example, actually it was a volition example, uh, where the client, uh, they had really good income, but they didn't have the down payment. So they got them qualified for the mortgage, and I think their purchase price was in the mid-million dollar range, I believe. And we said, look, we can qualify you for this, but you don't have the down payment for it. That's the problem. And then they said, well, my parents have a HELOC for a line of credit. They're going to use that. Their property's free and clear. We're going to do a HELOC. I was like, well, you could do that. Uh, but then we uncovered that you know, their parents were a little older, and qualifying for a HELOC would have been an issue. HELOC rates are 7.2% and up, and someone's going to have to pay that, and they would likely have been our client. So what we did was, again, just some fact-finding. We said, hey, we can put a huge reverse mortgage on your parents' property. They've got no mortgage on that. I think we're able to do about 500 or 600, something like that. I don't remember the number. And what we ended up doing was they took half of that amount, bought a property, and their sibling used the other half to uh, uh, go out and get a property as well. So in this particular example, you know, they just didn't they qualify. They just have the down payment. So we were able to use that. And this is kind of like the bank of mom and dad. We're seeing a lot more applicants who just, I mean, who has like two, 300 grand as, their first, as a first time buyer, right? You might have good income, but you don't have the down payment. So if you're going to be using mom and dad, uh, this is one recommendation we often make is like, maybe your parents have a home and this is a great way to access that because they're not burdened by having to make mortgage payments, right? Um, tax planning, this is a funny story. So we had this dentist who owned a, three or four million dollar house in Oakville, I think. Free and clear, he sold his practice and he was like in the 70s. And uh, we, had, we had a little session with him. We were like, what's your goal? He's like, well, I want to just live off some income. I sold my practice and I made a few million dollars off of that. It's sitting in a company. But if I take any of that money out, I'm gonna be taxed on it. So we said, why don't we just do a reverse mortgage? I think in his case, he was able to get about a million and a half cash out of the property. And he was able to take all that money out tax-free and never have to make any payments on it. So when you compare that to taking out a million or a million and a half from his company, he would have been heavily taxed. So there's actually, in some cases, like some interesting tax implications, if it makes sense for some people. Uh, you know, some people are just using them to buy a place in Florida. You know, if you've got a house that's free and clear and you want to be a real estate investor, you can take money out of there tax-free and just straight up buy a place, you know, with no financing at all. So pretty popular one. We already talked about the gifted down payment or using you know, funds for, for that. Uh, another big one that I think I have a case study on is a renovation. So you know, parents might live in a property that if we could add a laneway house or maybe a basement here or so on, will enhance their, their ability to generate some cash flow. This is an easy way to unlock some money and use that to enhance the property. Um, I think, I don't know. Oh. Okay, maybe I need to click it 20 times. Uh, so the first case study, I think I've got two of them that we see quite a bit is, just 
just an income supplement. This is a really basic example. Property's worth one and a half million. There's no mortgage on there because they're retired. They've paid it off. 65 years old. They would probably get about 625K tax-free into their bank account. If they were to invest that at something like 8%, they'd make $50,000 a year for the rest of their life. Super basic, right? And that's, that's a real life scenario. It happens all the time as an alternative to selling the house, for example. And some people don't want to sell their house. They want to use it as their sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the main space for their family to come, their grandkids to see them. So that's, that's one very basic case study. The number one question we get is, if I'm not paying my mortgage, doesn't that mean my balance is going up? Yes, it does mean that. So in this example, let me use this fancy tool again. So the house starts at one and a half million and they borrowed 625. So there's about 875 of available equity day one when they start this thing. Fast forward 10 years, I believe I applied a 3% growth rate in Toronto, which I'm pretty sure is super conservative. That property would be worth 2.2 and 10 million using that 3% growth rate. The reverse mortgage, which started at 625, has basically doubled. Uh, it's, it, the interest has uh, uh, accrued at 653,000. So the total loan is now 1.2, but the equity down here is 941, which means that even though they haven't paid anything for 10 years, there's still a decent amount of equity there. And in fact, a little bit more than it started with, uh, even though they've accumulated $650,000 of interest. So as long as there's growth in the property, there continues to be equity in the property. So this is why it, it can be a really attractive option. And I'll explain one more scenario, which is a little bit more investor friendly. So we had a client who had a North York bungalow, I believe it was. It was worth about a million and a half pre-renovation. They put about a million dollars of renovation into it. They used a combination of HELOC investments, savings, so on. They put in their own money into the reno and they converted it into four units. Um, the post reno value was 2.8 million. And because of the $2.8 million, based on their age, they were able to unlock a little over a million dollars. So what they did is they took that million dollars, paid off whatever debt or balances they needed for the construction. They now have a $2.8 million house with a $1.1 million balance that has zero payments. But more importantly, they now have in the three additional units, because they're living in one, they have $7,500 of rental income. So they've just increased their cash flow by $7,500, and they've increased the value of the asset by $2.8 million at 65 years old. And using the same sort of graph as before, you know, value of the property starts at 2.8, equity is 1.7, fast forward 10 years, it's worth 4.1, and the equity is a little bit higher at 1.8. So again, there's a lot of value in these sort of things, right? So for anyone who's got older parents, or sometimes as an exit strategy, instead of, instead of selling your real estate, maybe take out some money tax-free through the reverse mortgage, and you can either live off of that, invest it, or do whatever you want to do. So again, a pretty interesting option that we are seeing a lot more of. I'm going to skip the check-in. Uh, so I want to get into the uh, final oh, question. Sorry. So you had a HELOC currently, and, and you wanted to get a, um, a, reverse? a reverse mortgage to pay off the HELOC and not have to make any payments. Is that yeah. possible? 100%, yeah. So, so you don't need to have the house free and clear. These are just examples that, that were live, so I was using them. I have an example for someone who called me today. He's got a $600,000 mortgage on a two point something million dollar home. It's coming up for maturity in October, I think he said. And he's like, I want to reverse. I don't want to pay this anymore. I want to, I'm paying five grand a month on this thing, and the rates are not going to go that much lower, and I want to retire. He's, I think he just turned 65. And I said, look, you know, we, I did the math. You would qualify for about 700 grand, so a little bit more. So we'll pay off the mortgage. If you want the difference, you can take it as cash, so 100 grand, and you never have any payments literally for the rest of your life. I mean, and he's like, done. So let's reconnect in October. So yeah, this is, it's a proper plan. The problem is that most people don't like the idea, and the ones that don't like it are usually the kids, like the 40, 50-year-old, the ones who are, Inheriting the property, they're like, wait a second, mom and dad, this is wild. We can't do this, <laughs> affecting my inheritance. But the sad part is, like, when we talk to the parents, like, I had a client who was like, Hugo, I have a six hundred thousand dollar mortgage, house is worth two and a half million, but I need to borrow money on my visa to pay for dentures. I can't afford them. I live off of like two grand. I'm like, this makes a lot of sense to me, but your kid is saying, no, 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 I don't want you to touch it. I, that's why I wanted to show you this, this slide. Oh, oops, the uh, the equity slide. 
in the in a normal sort of growth environment, and I was actually using only three percent, you still have equity in the property because you're not lending the whole thing; you're only lending a small percentage of it. So there's still equity there, and you've just enhanced the lifestyle. So that, that's that's where we get a lot of pushback. <laughs> Well, you got to be at least fifty-five years old for a reverse mortgage. And it's primary. It's it's primary. And we have one lender, so there's three lenders in Canada that do it. One of the lenders will do a primary, and a secondary, and a cottage. Technically, they'll let you do all three of them, so you can kind of blanket one, two, or three together and unlock way more money. They won't do a rental, but secretly, as long as the appraiser doesn't say it's a rental, they'll 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 consider it. So. So qualifying is you just have to be 55 years old. That's the, that's the easiest way. And here's the reason, though. Think about it this way, though. Because like, if you're like 30 years old and you get a reverse mortgage, which doesn't exist. I mean, there, I'll give you one. There is one lender that will do it, though. If you're, if you're young, the idea is that it's very possible that in the next 50 years of your life, the balance may exceed the, uh, the, the property guys. They generally don't want you to be under 55 years. I've actually asked them, I was like, this is an interesting business model. So you started this company thinking like, I might not make any money for years until someone dies or sells the property. And uh, so CHIP or Home Equity is the biggest one in Canada. They've been doing this for 30 years. A lot of other companies are coming to the market. So Equitable Bank's fairly recent. They're doing a really good job. And you'll likely see a couple other lenders introduce themselves because as the population gets older, this is a very attractive product. Because they actually said to me, they're like, despite what you might think, most of our mortgages are broken in less than five years. Oh. Yeah. Why? Why? I don't know. Either they're dying earlier, or they're getting out of these things, or they're selling the properties. Yeah. So they're like, we don't have too many people who, who are riding the sell for 20 years, even though it's a completely reasonable and, 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 a, and a great financial tool. From what I understand, this is a trade-off between putting money somewhere else, like capital allocation, that is a better rate of return or more Lifestyle flexibility. Well, well, here's another way of looking at it, though. If you've got a two, a mil, let's say a million dollar asset in Toronto, free and clear, no mortgage. If you want to take money out of that property, you have to qualify for it, and you have to pay back whatever that loan is. So, for a lot of people, they may not be in a position to qualify, or whatever that loan, like you know, you take out a hundred thousand dollars at a HELOC rate of seven point two. If you invest that in the market. Maybe you'll do a little bit better than 7.2, but the difference is so marginal that by the time you pay interest, it might not be worth it. Or take all that money out tax-free, throw it into whatever you want to do with it, Bitcoin or whatever, it doesn't matter really, um, and you'll be able to uh, uh, live off of that interest and not have any payments for, in exchange for having the balance go up a lot higher. What kind of interest rates? That's a good question. I didn't actually mention that. So the interest rates are going to be very similar, but below private lending rates. So you've got a lending rate. Let me just kind of give you a range. And I know it's not on the board. So an a lender rate is going to be anywhere from like super low 499 for like a five year fix, like insured, that's kind of on the low end, all the way up to somewhere in the sevens. That's kind of the range of the a lending right now. A B lender will be around six and a half to maybe seven and a half range. And then a reverse mortgage, I think they're currently in the low eights today. And, it, it, and a reverse mortgage is still similar to a, a regular mortgage where you have to select a term. You can do a one-year, two-year, three-year term, and then you renew, even though you have no payments. So right now, I would tell someone, take a one-year term, 8.2, I think it is. At the end of the year, we'll renegotiate. Because I had some clients last year who were taking more reverse mortgages in the high fives, I believe it was. So yeah, the rates are higher, but you're not making any payments on it. When you take it out, does it affect your... So I say it again? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, so any any funds that you withdraw from your home or any equity that you've withdrawn, it's not considered taxable income. So it wouldn't affect any OAS or anything else that's linked to your income as a pensioner. Yeah, that's a really good one actually, because that's that's a big question. It's like, well, I've got all this extra cash now, I'll stop getting OAS, but it doesn't actually apply. Because it's technically still a loan. And technically, you can still write it off if you're renting some part of that house. Let's say you're renting the basement. In that example, um, I think it's this one, actually. It's a four, fourplex. So you still get a mortgage statement saying, hey, you borrowed, uh, whatever it is, a million dollars. Of that million dollars, 80000 of that is interest. I can allocate a percentage of that interest 
against uh, uh, the rental income that I earned because some of it was used for a percentage at home. So you can still write it off, even though you're not physically paying it. What about co-ownership? Um, okay, so and you, everyone on title has to be over 55. Okay. Easy solution is just take them off title if everyone's yeah. friendly. No, I own with my parents. Yeah. They couldn't do it because I'm on title. You could go off title and then just create a, a trust agreement or something. Right. Uh, that way we qualify. To replace me on title. Like Correct. So you would come off title. I actually had an incident just like that. Yeah. It was mom, dad, they were in their 60s, and son was, I don't know, probably early 30s. And he was only there to help them qualify. That was the only reason. And a little bit of tax planning. So they wanted to move forward the reverse mortgage. He came off title. We qualified mom, dad. And I believe they had some sort of a trust agreement or some back end agreement contract saying that, you know, he owns X, whatever so, it was. So our reverse mortgage could still happen if there are owners who are seniors. Yeah, whoever's on title has to be 55 plus, then it's definitely doable. But if there's anyone less than 55, they won't touch it. But there can be a trust on the owner. Can there be a trust? <laughs> We're recording this, right? <laughs> the lender can't know there's a trust, no. Okay. They wouldn't know about it. It's just a document that you have completely right. separate, if that's how you have to go about doing it. It might be more challenging, though, to use a bear trust agreement in this case. Right. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with bear trust taxation and you know, yeah. filings now yeah. to agree for it. So you might have a harder time having that. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, I don't see them too often, but that's how you could manage it. Obviously, you'd have you want to talk to your accountant. If I come off, what are the tax implications? And if I have this agreement, is that an option? We wouldn't tell the lender that, but because the lender wants to qualify just to, yeah. But yeah, if this is something that could apply to you, it could be maybe a financial tool for your parents. I think someone had a question. If you um, had the uh, reverse mortgage and you decided to sell that property, yeah. 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 You just pay back, it's just like a normal mortgage, you just pay back whatever is owing. What if you're locked into a term? Like then you pay a penalty like a normal mortgage, whatever the penalty, it's a pretty standard penalty as well. So basically, one year term is probably the best thing. Right now, I would definitely say take a one year term. Like, take a one year term, it's like in the low eights, I believe. Next year, it's probably reasonable to assume the rate would be lower so that you would be renewing it to a better rate. Uh, yeah. Um, what are the, what are the, um, the tiers in terms of age and LTVs? So at around 55 years old, you're probably borrowing 32% of the mortgage, of the value, sorry. And as soon as you get like in a 65 plus, you're closer to 40, 45%. And then anything over like 75, you're almost at 55%. Sorry, is that of the value or the equity? Of the value of the property. Not directly. Yeah. Just so whatever the value of the property, right. there's a whole formula, there's actually calculators online, everywhere, mortgage, reverse mortgage calculator. You type in property value, postal code, because some postal codes are not attractive to them, and then the age, and it'll just tell you exactly how much you can borrow. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, but yeah, like I just, I did one, uh, I think he was 70 years old, and we were almost at 45% loan to value of the appraised value that they assess it at. Yeah. Has that changed? I, I, I remember you saying before, maybe at, it was 50? At 65, you could get to about 50% Value. It goes as high as 55, but I think you have to be over 75 or so to get there. It's not as common. One thing that they will guarantee is in the unlikely event where the mortgage balance exceeds the value, they guarantee they won't take your home and you just owe them zero. <laughs> yeah, they made a big deal out of that. I actually met with one of the executives at CHIP, which was the biggest one a few weeks ago. And she brought that up. She was like, in our whole history of 30 years, we only had that happen like once or twice. Where, and that's why we added that guarantee feature where if, you know, all of a sudden, you know, for example, in Alberta, Alberta has had a boom recently, but in the last, maybe before two or three years from now, it's just been flat. And if you had a reverse mortgage, value is the same, mortgage keeps going up. And if that continued, eventually you would hit a peak where you've gone over. They guarantee that in those situations, they won't take your home. They're just, it's kind of like an even deal. Because I believe they understand that for the most part, there's enough equity there for them. Can I give another example? Yeah. I'm happy I included this because I wasn't sure if we were going to have a lot of questions, so that worked out. So another example that we um, have here at Volition is using a reverse mortgage when you've got bank from a bad, right? So think, imagine 
very, very common scenario. The scenario you presented was the Gen Xer, the millennial, had a good job, qualified for a mortgage, didn't have a down payment. That was your example, yep. right? But imagine a, a slightly different example where you know mom and dad have a two million dollar home, and they can access maybe fifty percent of loan salary in that one million dollar reverse mortgage. Don't have to debt service it. Don't have to pay uh, a monthly mortgage on that. And if they handed that million dollars to their Gen Xer or millennial adult child who couldn't get into the housing market, imagine that they bought a triplex. A triplex in Toronto is about 1.5 million, makes about $7,500 in rent, and it deducts about $1,000 for expenses. If you if they went to buy that one and a half million dollar home using that million dollars from imagine they didn't have, they didn't have uh, any down payment in this case um, and their mortgage qualification was quite limited. Imagine that they made hundred grand. Hundred grand qualified for about a five hundred dollars. Uh, less than that, like three fifty. Okay. Let's Wait, say that let's say four. They made, let's say they made a uh, hundred twenty five grand. <laughs> Close to five. Yeah, sure. They, they qualified for about five hundred thousand dollars mortgage. Million dollar down payment in the form of the reverse mortgage, the funds coming from the adult, from the parents, uh, they qualify for a $500,000 mortgage. Now they can buy a $1.5 million triplex that makes $7,500 So following that, deduct $1,000 of expenses, then deduct about $3,000 a month for the $5,000 mortgage, about $600,000 for every $100,000 in borrow. So it's about $3,000 a month. So your expenses are $4,000 including your mortgage and all of your uh, carry costs, you make $7,500 in rent. All of a sudden, you have a positive cash flow of $3,500 a month. That could go into the piggy bank. That could go back to the, the reverse. Adult. Go back to the reverse, too. I didn't mention that, but you can like prepay it. Oh, you can prepay it. Okay. Yeah, if you want. Well, what, actually, what I was going to say was to help fund the retirement of For said that. parents. Yeah. Parents. The, the boomer parents could receive a stipend from their children in the form of the $3,500 a month. So what have you got now? You've got maybe a $2 million home in Bungalow in Willowdale, that you know, family home has been a family home for 40 years or whatever. Mom and dad decide they want to continue living there. They don't want to downsize, but they want to access the equity. But they can't qualify because they don't have an income because they're retired. And number two, they don't want to have to pay a freaking monthly mortgage. So because they don't have to pay that monthly mortgage, this now creates cash flow, where cash flow didn't exist before. So this is just a, a slightly different spin. Your examples are good examples, but it's another slightly different spin. It doesn't require renovations or anything like that. It, it's a combination of using the bank mom and dad, and now the adult child has the ability to buy and to own real estate here in Toronto. And then positive cash flow goes back to the parents. So it's a win-win-win scenario all the way around. So like, there's lots of countless number of these types of examples. Um, you just have to be creative in terms of what it is for you. Yeah, no. Question? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's a minimum page. Is there a maximum page? No. <laughs> they wouldn't, so the question is, there's a minimum age, is there a maximum age? No. The older, the better is what they tell me. Uh, even better because again uh, this is a horrible thing to say but realistically if I'm a bank giving you money and you're 95 you know I hope you live really long but you're probably not gonna live that much longer so the likelihood of you pay me out sooner is very high so the, the older the better in this circumstance yeah. I haven't had a 95 year old I feel horrible if I like, listen I know you're really right but I got this thing going on um, yeah, I mean, it, I'll be honest with you, like, I think it's a, it, it's, it's a really attractive financial planning tool. If you're sitting on a lot of equity, instead of selling your home and downsizing to a condo, continue to enjoy the, the, the equity appreciation on a one and a half, two million dollar home in Toronto and live off of the, uh, the equity without having to make any payments. I think it makes sense. I didn't actually, so Matt had a great example. I did have that exact same slide last time I, I think, first brought it up. The example was using the reverse mortgage for the down payment and having zero payment on that obviously increases cash flow quite a bit. And we can find the mix. It doesn't have to be a huge down payment of a million dollars. We can figure out where do you want to be at. Maybe you only want to take out 750 from your uh, your parents and we give you a 750 mortgage because that's where the math balances up. So there's a lot of ways to, to go about it.
Uh, I don't know if I have any more reverse mortgage questions. Do you guys have any? No? Cool. People are really, really scared of reverse mortgages. There's a, there's a stigma around it. There's a like, huge stigma, yeah. A lot of it comes from the US. So if you Google reverse mortgages, it's just like, why reverse mortgages are bad. And a lot of it is that idea that you lose the equity on the property. But I mean, there's a lot of interesting calculators. You can plug in what the average appreciation would be on the home and whatever loan you're taking out, and you can kind of see it for yourself. And that's why I, want, I thought it was important to show those slides. For the most part, I mean, yeah, that you're able still to retain a good amount of equity. Like again, in this example, I, I mean, I was using 3%. What do you think that is a reasonable appreciation over the next 10 years? I mean, 3% is low. We historically have been using 5% uh, for modeling purposes. So the Canadian average over the past four years is about 5.12%. Yeah. And Toronto previously had a very high rate of appreciation. Yeah. So way higher. So we only use 3%. It's actually not that high at all. And still a lot of value there. And your equity remains the same. Obviously, you don't have that extra million one of interest in terms of equity. But these people were able to enjoy a million dollars of reverse mortgage which I'm sure enhanced their lifestyle and that equity and that income that came with it. So again, I think as a retirement tool, it's one that goes often unnoticed. A lot of people are still thinking I should sell my home, downsize, and then invest the rest of it. But why not keep both, right? Um, so we, we, we normally get into what we call a, a blueprint. And the idea is being strategic in investing. What I've done is I've kind of tweaked it a little bit. Some of you guys might be newer to this and maybe some of you have seen it before. So I've got just a few slides. One of them will address your your mortgage. I think it's the last one. And the, the, the idea is trying to understand which lenders we should go to as you build your portfolio. So the first one is the beginning stage. So anywhere from the first one to four properties, for the most part, the banks have lots of different policies and rules and allowances to give you financing for those first one to four properties. I call this the setup stage. Um, so some of the features, you know, you're probably, if you qualify, you go to a big bank, you get access to some of the best rates. You can get a line of credit on rentals, which is still available. Um, you can split the mortgages. This is a, a strategy that I recommend quite a bit. And what that means is, you know, we don't know where rates are going. Maybe I take half the mortgage as a variable rate, the other half as a fixed. You can kind of get creative, you know, with some of these uh, early solutions. Um, and it's really important as you buy your first rental or before you buy your first rental, to see if there's any value in refinancing your personal residence. Because I'll give you an example. I had a client with a personal residence with a, it wasn't a huge mortgage balance, but he was making super aggressive payments. I think the balance was like a hundred grand and he was paying a thousand a week. And I was like, you're paying four grand a month. You only really need to pay 500 a month or 600 a month. By you showing four grand a month, your borrowing power is way less. So we had a conversation because he was like, I want to buy three properties this year. So we had a conversation on how a refinance on his personal residence would be really important to set him up for the next couple of properties, right? So understanding how you're affected on your personal residence will be helpful. We actually were just talking with Ali on how if you have multiple rentals, different mortgage balances and different cash flows, sometimes it makes sense to refinance a rental and redistribute the, the, the balances to the other properties. So the portfolio is a little bit more balanced for lending purposes, right? So really important to have these conversations, the first one to four, but you can get away with a lot of stuff at this stage. It starts getting a little messy if you're at property number five, right? I call this like the rebound stage. What happens is of the 80 plus lenders that we work with, maybe less than you know eight will consider lending you uh, some financing. And the banks are going to start looking at your portfolio like a business. So they're going to look at the DCR, the debt cover ratio, which ideally should be at 1.1. 1 .1. So all that really means is for every uh, um, uh, $100 of expenses, you have $110 of income. So there's more income than expenses is the basic explanation. And the reason for that is if we're qualifying you for financing and you already own four or five properties, we want to make sure that this portfolio makes sense. And that's why I said filing your taxes, reporting income is important because if you're not doing that, the bank might say, look, I don't care if you make a billion dollars. This is actually something some banks will do this. I don't care if you make all this money and that you can service all these properties on your income. Because the properties don't service themselves, we won't give you a mortgage because in the event that you stop earning this income, we want to make sure that your portfolio will continue to sustain itself. So it's really important to make sure that your portfolio makes sense at this stage. And that's why we have to understand what you're reporting to your tax return so we can make sure that we can uh, find a home for it. Some big banks will still look at, you know, properties up to 10 properties. 
Um, there's a lot less of them. Typically, we're going to credit unions and B lenders at this stage, if, if we can't find a home for on the B side. Uh, and it's really important to refinance before you buy the fifth property, because as soon as you get to the fifth property, it doesn't matter how amazing your portfolio looks, the banks may just stop giving you money. Uh, I'll give you an example. I have a client, he owns four, uh, I think they're just four small condos he's had forever. Tiny balances, they're like 50,000 each. And he wants to scale his rental portfolio and start buying a bunch of properties. But because he's already got four rentals, all these little $100,000 condos he had a few years ago in a, like Saskatchewan or wherever it was, I was like, your borrowing power is significantly limited regardless of the fact you have a lot of income because of all these existing properties. So what we ended up doing is we moved them into a holding company and we kind of moved it away from his portfolio to help him buy some more properties. So it's really important before you buy number five to have a conversation with someone on, on what that looks like. And now this is kind of what you were asking. If you're at this 10 property stage, very often people are coming to us and they're like, I haven't had any financing for years. The banks won't touch me. I've got too many properties. What are my options? So what we can try to do is look at turning your rental portfolio into a business and looking at commercial lending options. We call that like a commercial blanket. And the idea is like, let's say you have 10 single family homes, so duplexes or triplexes. The banks won't give you any more money because maybe you stopped working because you got all this rental real estate um, and you just don't qualify anymore and you don't want to go with a private and you don't want to go with a B. You might want to look at a commercial blanket. And all it really is is imagine you have 10 properties and 30 units. The banks will look at your file as if it was a, a building with 30 units. What does this 30 unit portfolio look like in terms of income and expenses? And if you can meet the standard commercial criteria, we might be able to move that whole portfolio to the commercial side, put it under a big commercial mortgage, and now you have zero properties in your name. The idea is we generally put that in a company. So move it from your personal to the corporate, put it under a blanket in a company name, and now you're back to square one. You have maybe just your personal residence, and we can help you scale again. So this is one one approach. Well, there's no way around that. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, the, I think land transfer, right? Land transfer tax. Yeah. So there's a lot of costs with it. It doesn't always make sense for everyone. So if you've got ten properties in your personal name, and the recommendation is you need to put this in a holding company, you're going to pay capital gains, which, to be fair, you were going to pay anyways. You're just paying it. Uh, I think in most cases you can defer it. By the way. But there is a capital gain trigger, and you're definitely paying land transfer taxes. But no, I don't. I mean, I'm not an accountant, but I don't think so. No, uh, I, I just found that this is super random. I was reading on the way here. There's going to be like a, a, a rain tax. You guys hear about this? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. What the hell? So, so like, <laughs> I literally read like the first three lines. I think uh, uh, the Toronto is looking to introduce a rain tax for any rain, <laughs> excess rain you have on your property. I think they're just making stuff up now. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure the land transfer tax is not going anywhere. Um, but you just have to do a cost-benefit analysis. If it's going to cost you two hundred thousand dollars of land transfer taxes, you're unlocking two, three million. Yeah, it makes sense. So I don't think I actually have it here, do I? Oh, I do. There you go. Perfect Good timing. <laughs> Up to seventy-five percent loan to value. That's the, so it's a commercial mortgage. So they generally will cap you at seventy-five percent. Uh, usually 25 year amortizations is the max. And you need CDT, right? That's a good question. <sighs> so the question was, can you, can you do CMHC lending? So CMHC, for those of you who don't know, has a, a program where if you have five units or more, they'll give you access technically to 85% of the home value, and they'll amortize it 40 years, sometimes a little bit longer, right? So very, very attractive. And lower rates too, because they're insured. So you have to pay insurance premium to do all this. So there's definitely attractive. I would say in, in some rare cases, we've been able to do it, but the CMHC program is not for this thing. So the CMHC program is to stimulate the development of more real estate and housing to help plug in all the affordability issues that they have. So the idea is not to make your portfolio cheaper because in the <laughs> rare, in the rare instances where we've done this, we were able to move the whole portfolio to CMHC, so the client got way better rates and terms. But the money that they unlocked, they used to buy more real estate. So in that scenario, it met their criteria for buying more real estate, and we were able to do it. But I generally, it's, it's just a non-CMHC thing. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, you're not adding houses. You're just adding more money to your pocket, I guess. 
<laughs> Again, in the scenarios we've done it, they actually had some projects lined up, and we moved money from here to there, and they did it that way. But most of, like, almost always, it's like a non CMC regular commercial mortgage, and these things are rare. Like, we don't do too many of them because it's it's like you got ten properties. Let's say they're worth eight or ten million dollars. They're usually not all Toronto properties, and you've got like thirty percent loans of value, so tons of equity. In that example, yeah, it's probably worth paying a few hundred thousand dollars of tax, land transfer taxes, legals, and all this stuff to take that money out and maybe re redeploy it to some other opportunities. But sometimes people just look at the numbers and like, I don't want to pay four or five hundred grand of fees and all this stuff to do it. So it's it's not for everyone, but it can make sense for a lot of people. So that's that's kind of the deal. So it, it is possible, but it doesn't always work out to make sense. So it is a commercial mortgage. So the rates and fees associated with getting a commercial mortgage would be applicable. So commercial mortgages are anywhere from high fives to low sixes, let's say, on average. But they will charge you a fee and, and appraisals and all this stuff to get it done, which are more expensive than a normal mortgage. But you do have the debt coverage ratio. It's a little higher than a, than a traditional residential. So that's kind of the that's kind of the deal with the blueprint. So the setup for one of those is really complicated. It's quite involved too. Yeah. I know a, a client who's like it was like two years in the making. In order yeah, to because you, generally you're, you you know we get involved to propose the solution for you. Then you normally will reach out to your accountant to determine what your costs and, and the best way to actually structure it. You might you're going to likely have to open a holding company to move all this stuff to. So there's lawyers involved, and then appraising and dealing with the immature. Because generally you want to link the maturities with moving it. You don't want to have like ten properties that you just break because then there's even more penalties. So yeah, it's a bit of a process. So it's not something that you generally just do in a month or two. Uh, probably not environmental. So usually with a commercial mortgage, you have an appraisal, inspection, and environmental. The environmental is to determine that the building doesn't have anything that could affect the value of the property. With this type of commercial lending, the assets are pretty much all single-family type properties, so the environmental is usually not an issue for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I think this is the end. <laughs> so mortgage trends and rates, so I, I think I just want to highlight what's going on with rates, bring it back to reality and some recommendations on what you should be doing if you're refinancing or renewing, so on. Um, okay, so start with variable rates. So variable rates, prime is still 7.2. I wrote with most lenders because TD is at 7.35, which is super weird because it's really confusing when my client's like, I got prime less one with TD. And I'm like, well, it's really prime less 85 with everyone else. It just sounds better. but. Um, by their prime being a little higher, their penalties are also a little bit higher because they based off their penalties off a, a different rate. So, anyways, prime rate seven point two. Um, the average variable rate, and then like, don't take a photo and send this to me. And this is what you said. This is just an average. In some cases, it could be a little bit lower, a little bit higher. This is just kind of a general range to give you an idea if you're planning. So, a five-year variable rate at six point two. If you get six point two, that's prime less one. That's pretty damn good. But on the lower end, those are still available, and sometimes even better than that, all the way up to 6.8. Like, that's kind of the range that you want to be. If it's higher than 6.8, it's probably not a good deal, or there might be some other circumstances that are working against you, but that's kind of a reasonable rate if you're up for renewal. And then on a rental property, a lot of banks will charge a premium. Not all of them, but the ones that do, you'll see the rate shifts a little higher. So 6.4 to prime is kind of the average. So that's kind of variable rates today. Oh wow, this is a messy slide. Okay, um, let me start with the left side. <laughs> I think I was trying to put all on one slide. Um, okay, so let's talk about three-year fixed rates. And the, the reason I'm doing three and five is because if you're going with a fixed rate, generally I'm gonna recommend a shorter term. So I wanted to show you what three-year rates look like. So the average three-year rate can be as low as 499 to five and a half range for a personal residence, and then a little higher for rentals at the bottom there. So 539 to 629. If you're looking at five-year rates, even lower, so as low as 4.79 with some banks to like the mid fives, and then a little bit higher for rentals. I probably wouldn't be recommending a five-year fix for most people, unless you're putting down like 5%, and you're probably not going to have any equity for the next few years anyways. Probably not a bad idea to go with a five-year fix. And then this graph has two lines. The pink one is the one to three-year. And the blue one is the five years. So you'll notice a trend. From, so this is 2019, for those of you who can't see. So from 2019 
these are bond yields, by the way. So bond yields will determine where mortgages are at. So if you want to know if rates are going up or down, you can literally just Google search, you know, five year or one year or three year, but whatever, whatever term you're interested in, just search that. On our website, vinegroup.ca, we actually have a resource you can click on, and it has all the bond yields for the different terms. So it's a good way to see where the trend is for rates. So if you're seeing rates trend upward, the banks are going to be very quick to increase rates fast. If the trend is downward, the banks are super slow. They're like, well, let's wait it out for a few weeks and then we'll start decreasing rates. So, you know, you will notice that we had this big uptick in rates in the last two years. And for the most part, they have been decreasing. There was a little period of uptick earlier this year, but for the most part, they have been coming down a little bit and they'll likely continue to slowly come down. So I thought that was an interesting graph to kind of show you what the data is telling us. And, um, Okay, so variable or fixed. I guess it depends on your pro profile, depends on your risk tolerance and so on. But, you know, if the average bank economist feels that rates will go down by 1%, by 99% likelihood, according to their uh, data, if you're getting a variable rate today, somewhere in the sixes, let's say 6.5%, for example, that rate could easily be 5.5% uh, by the end of this year, and then maybe even lower the year after. So there's a very strong argument, in my opinion, to consider a five-year variable rate because you could see that rate somewhere in the fives and then lower as you go forward. And you always have the option with a variable rate to lock into a fixed term at any point. So one recommendation I've been having for a lot of clients is if you're getting a variable rate today, ride it out for the next two years. The next two years, I think it's very reasonable that rates will come down. But by year three, we'll start to hit some sort of new plateau where rates might no longer come down or come down a lot less. And that might be a good opportunity to lock in for the remaining three years or just write it out the whole thing, right? So that's kind of what I've been suggesting on the variable side. Um, if you have to go fixed, take anywhere from a one to three year term. A one year term right now is probably in the high sixes. A two year gets a little lower than the three year can kind of be in that sort of lower 5% range. So if you have to go fixed, take into consideration the fact that you're stuck with that for the next couple of years. And if you try to get out of it, there's going to be a way higher penalty than the normally would have been because the rates are a lot higher now. Uh, what else do I got here? And so if you are buying, this won't apply to investors for the most part because you can't buy a home with less than 20% down. But if you are buying something with less than 20 down, I probably would recommend a variable because there's some really, really generous variable rate discounts out there. And because you can't refinance a mortgage that has less than 20% down until you have enough equity, you're probably going to be stuck with whatever you choose anyway for a few years. So a variable rate could be really attractive. Unless you're risk averse, then just go with a fixed for five years. Um, if you're up for renewal, like right, right now, because the rates are trending downward, but we haven't seen enough of a drop to, to recommend a long-term hold, I've been telling some people, maybe just flip your maturing mortgage into a HELOC. So I've got a client who was up for renewal at the end of uh, this month. And he's like, you know, I really, really want to get into a fixed rate. It's my preference, but rates are so high right now. And I said, well, why don't, you can either go with a variable rate and lock into a fix later, or if you want to be completely open, just renew into a HELOC, just your balance right into a HELOC, ride that out because it's fully open, and then convert that whenever you want to. So if you want the maximum flexibility, get into a HELOC, or if you're going to sell the property, get into a HELOC. Um, so I talked about blending it. So some, some banks will let you do both. Or maybe multiple. You can have like a on a half a million dollar mortgage. You can do two hundred thousand variable, two hundred thousand fixed, and then the, the difference on some other terms. So you can have multiple terms. So like an investment, you can diversify the different rate options if you like as well. And that is all I have. <laughs> My daughter saw this photo the other day. She's like, "You gotta update this. You don't look like that anymore." <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got it. Um, any questions, guys? You know, my contact details are on there. Um, won't be hard to find us online. We're always we're always at these events, and these guys are huge partners of us. And the reason we love working with them is whenever they send us a file, it actually makes sense. Um, just <laughs> I'm trying to be careful with what I say. I have a file that came from another realtor <laughs> who's not in this room. And, uh, it has nothing to do with volition, and it's, it just doesn't make any sense. This deal. I was like, we could finance this, but it's a crappy deal. But we could do it. The client's aware it's a crappy deal, but we went forward with it. Then the appraisal came in lower, the rents aren't what we were told. The whole thing is just really, really messy. It's super annoying for us. When I get a deal from Relition, you know, I know that you know, the, the data that we're using is consistent, it's reliable, 
and it's the right solution for the clients. So they've been awesome, and you know, hopefully, you guys uh, uh, are able to take away some great value from all the stuff that I shared and from the night too. So, all I got. Thank you, sir. Um, do you want to flip back to the other deck? So, actually, while we're doing that, any questions then for Hugo? Um, no? Well, that's great. I, I guess everybody got their questions answered uh, during the presentation. We, we need to update this photo, too. Yeah, we're, we're, using, we're using the same photo. It's the same one. <laughs> okay. So, um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, if you are interested in... Let me take a step back. <laughs> a lot of people come out to these events. I used to come out to events. I still go out to events. Um, sadly, a lot of people don't do anything with it. And you know, while it would be great if you do something with us, <laughs> we just do something, right? And if, if, you're, if you want to do something with us, we're, the first step really is to book an advisory meeting. So what that is, is we sit down with you 30 minutes. We kind of go through where you are currently in, you know, in your real estate investing journey. That can be at zero, right? And where you want to get to. And we work through a, a plan and to make the best use of that time. Just make sure you're coming with all your numbers, um, you know, have an idea of what your goals are. Uh, we can walk you through what that plan is. Uh, the other thing that I think uh, is a bit surprising for folks is about more than 50%, probably we're closing on like 60, 70% of our business now is regular real estate. Even though we've built a reputation and everybody knows us as investor realtors, we do mostly normal stuff. Um, why? Uh, so it tends to be clients who want to apply a real estate investing lens to regular real estate. So they're just not wanting to buy a condo. Well, while we can help you with that, quite frankly, you don't need an investor realtor to help you with just buying some condo in the middle of nowhere. Now, if you want to buy a condo that maybe you're thinking about renting out in the future and you want to make sure that it's in an area of gentrification and you want to understand what the you know mass transit uh, growth is in the in the in the neighborhood. You want to understand your tenant profiles? Then call us, right? Like that. That's more our niche. Um, so yeah, because we apply all these things that I talked about that we do to investment realty to regular realty. You want to put in a I don't know. You want to rent out your basement? Well, you can't just do that anywhere. Um, you have to. There's a whole bunch of rules you need to follow. Your you need legal basement ceiling heights, you need fire separation, all this kind of stuff. So we help uh, people in that uh, respect as well. Um, construction development is something that comes up a lot for personal residents. Uh, because these days, especially in Toronto, you may be wanting to put a laneway suite or a garden suite in the back, uh, a nanny suite. Um, so that's where, where we can come in to help. Also, you know, people don't stay in their homes forever. And you may be considering to turn your personal residence. We have a bunch of clients who are doing this. The Street Smart Tour we did last month, two months ago, was exactly that. So personal residence, somebody's living there, but their intention is to turn it into a triplex or fourplex once they move out, right? So we bought them a home that they can rent at the basement, but the, the home can be turned into more uh, based on the layouts and locations, stuff like that. Anyway, so we're happy to help with uh, regular realty as well. Uh, our next meetup, very, very sadly, we will not be here anymore. We will miss you, Sam, I know. Um, so we're at a new location. Uh, that's not it. <laughs> it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. Yeah, it's under construction right now. We're going to meet in a triplex. Uh, no, it's at the Kingston House. Uh, so the Kingston House is, we'll, we'll call it Deep East York. <laughs> so it's further east that way. It's on Kingston Road. Um, Kingston Road and... Woodbine, I think. Oh, Kingston Road, Woodbine. Beaches. So beaches, yeah. Good, good for you folks who are out there. Uh, we have clients who walk to see us, <laughs> I, I think. Um, but we we have a architect coming out. He's one of the leaders in the space in multifamily development, in laneway suite development. Um, so like, literally cutting edge and understanding density changes for multifamily and building height allowance changes. So we're going to get pretty deep next week. Uh, hopefully that's going to be so next month. We're going to get pretty deep next month <laughs> um, on th those parameters. So because uh, I had a meeting with him and, you know, I, I thought my knowledge was here. Uh, and then we had a discussion. I was like, oh, I, I, I need to bring you in to talk about this because I've got a ton of questions for you. 
so we'll probably set it up a bit as a Q&A. It'll be a little less structured, but um, you know, in my one hour conversation with him prior to this meetup, I learned a ton. So hopefully that'll be good for you guys. Those are two projects he's worked on, which is why I have a picture of them over there. And just to put it in perspective, we built a bunch of these. Yes, of these we built these. We, we <laughs> built them and a couple of our projects were at the very forefront of some of the city of Toronto changes. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we knew more than the city did when they had like um, the four, four unit as of right. I remember DC, at the time, yeah, DC, DC deferral uh, on four units. And um, I remember we, one, one part of the city said, yeah, no problem. The other, the other side of the city says, here's your $200,000 DC charge. Uh, anyway, so we are, we, even us who was at the bleeding edge, we always have stuff to learn. What's happening with the changes that Ford was to make to the Ford so, uh, yeah, in case you're not aware, uh, the city of Toronto ha is allowing four units to be built as of right in an R-zoned neighborhood. So what does that mean? If you are in an uh, area where you're allowed mixed residential, so today you have detached, semi-detached, townhouses, that kind of stuff, so like the neighborhoods all around here, they're R-zoned, you're allowed to build four units, so, you know, four units <laughs> as of right. So uh, without DC charges, right? So you're allowed to build them. There's no um, development charges. Those can be quite expensive, tune of like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 per unit. So those are all gone. The idea is to enc uh, encourage densification in the city, right? Um, so you're allowed to do that. And the strategy a lot of folks are using now, uh, we're doing this with our clients. We have, uh, you know, private equity money talking with us and stuff like that. This is to add a fifth unit, additional dwelling unit, uh, lane, uh, laneway or garden suite. So you get to five and then you're refinancing commercially using CMHC because you're at five units, you qualify for CMHC and taking advantage of their MLI select program, uh, you know, through energy efficiency. So you're getting good rates, good amortization, right? 50, so, 50 year amortization. 50 year AMs. If you get up to 100 points, you can get 50 year AMs. And a DCR of 1.1. Yeah, low DCR. And we're seeing uh, one of our clients uh, qualified at 4.5% uh, interest, right? 50 year AM. So, changes the game. Um, this is not a secret. There's a lot of people trying to do this in the city. Uh, I was just on a podcast talking about the impact to this uh, for the city of Toronto. Um, I think sometimes as investors, we live in a bit of a bubble and we think like, oh, you know, in 10 years from now, everything's going to be a fiveplex. No. Like if you're going through this, you know that lot restrictions are tough. You've got trees to deal with. You need a, a, a lot with the right grading. Uh, you need to be 90 meters from a fire hydrant. Like all these things don't go away. You still have to build the place and apply, uh, you know, you've got Ontario building code to adhere to. So. But there will be a lot more of these kind of properties because I think it does make a lot of sense. Now it makes sense for developers and it provides more housing, right? Which is what we need. And they're starting to make changes now. So for example, one of the biggest changes, everyone's focusing on Bill 23. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, like build four fourplexes everywhere. We were already building fourplexes in, in, uh, in the best investable neighborhoods anyway. So that wasn't the big change. The DC exemption was a big change because yes. that's hundreds of thousands of dollars back into your pocket, so that's number one. Uh, number two is changes to the COA. So yeah, so, COA yeah to Matt's point, uh, committee of adjustments. So you used to have to go through a process where likely you're triggering what's called a minor variance. And what that means is maybe you need some more density because you, know, you need to fit in uh, two bedroom floor plans, or maybe your building is a little bit taller. There's always something that would trigger you parking, right? Uh, something that would trigger you to have to go to committee of adjustments. And at committee of adjustments, you're basically asking for an exemption to the zoning bylaws, right? At committee, it's, I won't say a free for all, but you're, you're, that's where people can complain, right? Now, committee is generally pretty good in that they're looking at the rule of law and you know, do you what is what you're doing make sense and apply to other variances that they have granted? That's kind of their job. Um, but now, uh, let's say you went to that and for whatever reason um, you got a ruling in your favor. 
it, the, the drama might not be over because that could be appealed. There, there was this time where you could take that and take it to what they called T-Lab, um, which is like the Toronto es escalation process, and you could get dragged out for months and months on end. That has, that's gone. Now the COA rules and that's it. There's no appeals process. So that has made a big impact to timelines for these kind of projects. So more specifically, it's your NIMBY neighbor. Yeah. Your NIMBY neighbor. You all know this term? NIMBY? Not in my backyard, right? So your NIMBY, your NIMBY neighbor can no longer appeal. So third party appeals are no longer part of the appeal process. Yeah. But I think the, the, there's other appeals that can still happen, like the city and other stuff like that. Yeah. But your NIMBY neighbor can't stop you anymore. Yeah. So now, like, if there is an appeal that happens, it can't be neighbor driven. It's usually city driven, right, or environmental driven, something like that. So that's a that's that's a, a big change. Uh, also, the there has been a move away from all these um, requirements. So if you're building multifamily, density allow uh, density requirements are gone. Uh, they are allowing taller buildings, longer buildings. So anyway, I don't want to take away everything that that. Um, from the next presentation, but that's the kind of stuff we'll be going through. So while it may not be applicable to what you're doing at this point, uh, I do see this impacting the city quite uh, massively over the next 10 years. And you never know, maybe you'll join up with another Volition client <laughs> and build a, build a fiveplex. That's uh, exciting. We, like, we've been holding this meetup for like, I don't know, eight, 10 years now. And we've, we've actually never we've taken people through Four plexes that we built before, and randomly built before, but we actually never had an architect uh, come in and talk about building multi multi-families before. Yeah. So this is this is new for us. This yeah. is a, this is this is this is exciting. Cool. And this is always how we like to end the evening with our motivational dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we believe everybody can do it. We all started ourselves, not as investors. It takes years and years to get there. So. You know, we just encourage you to start. That's the QR code if you're interested in booking a consultation with us. And thanks again, Hugo, for your time tonight. Uh, and we'll be around here to take questions. Thank you. Yeah.